Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us on this snowy February morning. We made it here, so we thank you all. So I'm Tracy Crawford. I'm the head of adult services here at the Montclair Public Library. And on behalf of MPL, I would like to welcome you to the library and to this afternoon's event. Writing Our Future, a celebration of Black children's literature. Today, not only are we celebrating Black History Month and Black children's literature, but we are also gathered to recognize the amazing achievements of Just Us Books as they celebrate their 35th anniversary. Founded by Wade Hudson and Cheryl Willard Hudson, Just Us Books began as a response to their own personal mission to discover as per Dr. Udine Sims Bishop states, windows and mirrors for their children. Pathways to instill knowledge of self, history, and communities through books, which reflected positive images through Black history, heritage, and diversity. Disappointed in the lack of offerings, the Hudson's made it their mission to create their own path by writing their own manuscripts, including their own Afro Vets ABC book, which taught the alphabet using Afrocentric themes and images. After they were rejected by mainstream publishing houses and were told that there was no market for Black children's books, they took things into their own hands and embarked on a 35 year journey of publishing their own books. Just Us Books. Over the past 35 years, Just Us Books has won numerous awards. In 2008, their picture book, The Secret Olivia Told Me by Anne Joy, illustrated by Nancy DeVar, was named the Coretta Scott King Honor Book for illustration. And the Hudson's were also honored for their contributions to literature with the Ida B. Wells Institutional Builders Award presented by the National Black Writers Conference. In 2018, Justice Books partnered with Pound Books to publish the anthology We Ride, We Re 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 Raise Our Voices, edited by Wade and Cheryl Hudson, and hailed a love song from children's literature's brightest stars on Christmas trees. More recently, in 2022, the Hudson's were recognized for their many contributions to children's literature with the 2022 Carl Honors Award from the Eric Carl Museum of Picture Book Art. And that fall, Justice Book's newest picture book, Kwame Nkrumah's Midnight Speech for Independence, written by Ukraine Eugene Perkins and illustrated by Laura Freeman, won the 2022 Children's Africana Book Awards Best Book for Young Children. Today, we are honored to join these trailblazers and history makers as they welcome friends, colleagues, legends, and newer voices in the celebration of Black children's literature and join them in passing on their proven belief that good books make a difference now and for generations to come. Just a bit of housekeeping before we get started books will be available for sale out of the auditorium. Uh, for purchase with our co collaborators on this event, Watch on Booksellers from Black Montclair's only Black Booksellers. And finding will take place on the left. The restrooms are now on the wall to your right. And so, with that being said, and without further ado, I am honored to introduce the first of today's presentations a fireside chat with Cheryl Willis Hudson and pioneering children's book illustrator George Ford. As they reflect on the path to more diversity in Kidlet and how we continue to progress. Wow, what a crowd we have here today. It's great being here uh, to chat with you, to talk with you. Let's see. If I turn the mic on. 
it's on. <laughs> uh, I'm really delighted to uh, be with you today uh, to talk about children's books and to talk about the industry and to celebrate Black history. We have uh, with us uh, walking history in uh, this youthful, uh, I don't know how you have to think, 97 year old. So you want to know anything about what happened back in, in the day, uh, you can have a conversation with George and he will tell you and he'll remember the day to day and the time. Um, we are celebrating Black children's literature. It's Black History Month. What better way to set the stage for writing our future than to be in conversation with a celebrated storyteller and visual artist who is going to take the mic and answer um, just a few questions in conversation. George Wood is a, a pioneer. He's been doing illustrations since the 1940s since I'm not gonna say before I was born, but close close to it. Let's let's say let's say that I found out in 1938, age of 12, that every kid likes to draw. But when I drew a picture of in those days, uh, it was Jackie Cooper, you know. When I did a picture of Jackie, it looked like Jackie Cooper. Yeah. So that's <laughs> the that's only difference too. So he went on. He's going to oh, tell us about, oh, use the mic. Okay, well, I haven't asked the first question yet, but as you can tell, George has lots of stories. So <laughs> let's begin. Uh, George has been a pioneer. He's been an advocate. He's been an activist. He's an educator. Uh, he was educated uh, at both Cooper Union, Pratt Institute, and also received a BA in education, art education from City College of New York. Uh, he's embodied Black history in all of his illustrations, uh, illustrations for textbooks, illustrations for African beginnings, working with Black theater. The first artist to win the Coretta Scott King Award for illustration in 1974 for Sharon Dell Mathis's biography, Ray Charles, and for dozens of other picture books. So we're reflecting with George today, and uh, we have a, a, a little bit of a time limitation. We could be here forever talking about <laughs> children's books, but I'm going to ask George to answer a couple of questions. Uh, tell us what it was like when you started in the industry. What were your challenges? Uh, where did you work? Uh, why have you continued to create? And finally, what would you like to see as we move forward in terms of writing our future for children's literature. Big question. I'm glad you. I'm Let's glad. Go. I'm glad. I'm glad you put them all in one question. Right. Okay. <laughs> if you had said, "Oh, I'm glad you reminded me," <laughs> so <clears throat> because uh, if you had said, "I want to ask you one question," I, I would do two hours on that one question. <laughs> yeah. Thing <Same> is <clears throat> that. Just as you see me here, every, most of you know me kind of, or now you know me good. <laughs> because essentially why I work, because of what happened when I was a kid, I was, talk, I was talking to Eric about it. As a child, I was in depression. I, when I was born, Calvin Coolidge was depressed. 1926 old. As an immigrant, as a children of immigrants, the immigrants, <clears throat> during the Depression, people who had a place to send their kids sent them. I was talking to Eric about this, so I just thought I'd mention that. My, my parents were from Barbados. So my mother's mother, I, my sister and I lived with them for four years. We, they sent us to Barbados so they could make ends meet. In 1935, my father said, you know, most people don't go back and get their kids. <laughs> they grow up there. <laughs> you know, they come back as adults and so on. I'm going to our kids. So I came here at the age of nine, 1935. <clears throat> and 
And when you grow up in a country where the people look like you, you think you're in a sovereign state. When you hear about America and you come here and you think, oh God, the streets of people go. And when you you have no idea what immigrants thought of America in the 20s and the 30s, you know, you go, this is it, this is Nirvana, this is everything. And then you get here and you come on the west side and the cobbled stones and the, and the L and everything else, and you get disillusioned. But the biggest disillusionment is something that I happened to experience as a child. And that is the foreign countries with their education. America requires fun. <laughs> And now, in addition to that, this was a mixed neighborhood. This was, not, this was Brownsville. This is everybody's first stop here, Brownsville. So I, I can't impress on you too much <clears throat> how badly they treated Black people from childhood on. Most of the time, we didn't notice it because it's accepted. This is what I'm fighting. This is why I've been this way from the giddy up. As a child, I found, I was telling, I'm glad we talked about that. Because as a child, I just found out I could draw. I mean, all kids draw. But we, because movies was new to me, we lived at the movies. I heard the food ups and did all and I got to know like some characters, you know. And Jackie Cooper was a child actor. You may have even heard of her. He became a TV star. But essentially, I was just telling him, I would draw that stuff. And not to be an artist, but just to draw. And all the other kids were drawing. And in this whole elementary school, nobody could draw like me. I mean, everybody was drawing, but by the time I got to sixth grade, first they put you back. Black. I came a new kid, so third grade, second grade, and all that. So in one year, I went three grades. But what I noticed most, and this is the most important part of, of all of it, but it was a terrible time. Just imagine, people were getting lynched in the South, just were looking cross-eyed. So the biggest thing, and people running from Germany, Jews were running from Germany, Poles were running from Germany. So but that was a melting pot. And the thing I noticed the most is that everybody came was better than us. The first thing you learn from America is if you're an immigrant, we were nice to each other until we found out they were white and we were not. And then they said, the protocol is that black folks don't count. Now, mind you, these are just words to most people. Really. They don't think it's really true. This is a land of opportunity. But you, you get it in your bones when you see that the black kids coming from the South are running from where they were discriminated against in the South. They never lived in a place where they were equal to anybody. And I could see it. You can feel it. And that was that was what you could see in your environment. So as you were drawing, you no, wanted no, no. to draw yourself. You hey, to get, you you're to... bringing me back yeah. to reality. That's good. <laughs> because I'm only trying to explain to you what's in me. I had no idea I was going to be an artist. In fact, if we got older, I might as well jump to the, 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 the real thing. <clears throat> I am older than everybody because I never dreamed I was going to be an artist. Because I, although I could draw, and all the kids in the and, and, and I was, I had an assembly where I just drew a horse and, and, and a cowboy, and the, and, the, and, the, and my class sang "Home on the Range." So I can't impress on you too strong, too too, 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 too clear a way. That the principal, when I got out of elementary school, said, you will go places. Everybody knew me. Because nobody else could draw. <laughs> my, no, they could draw. My stuff looked like what it was supposed to. That's the important thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm gonna and then, I'm gonna move you, I'm gonna move you into okay. the other artists of your time, uh Tom Feelings, uh Jerry Pinkney, my girl. the uh my girl. before we go any further. Karen Bell Mathis, I'm gonna take this before we go any further. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna, gonna, I'm gonna this this illustrate it. <laughs> quickly, quickly. Okay, be on Diane Dillon. Quickly, quickly. When I found out that you could you go to art school, I thought you wanted to learn to draw. 
In 1943, when I went to Pratt Institute, I was the only black kid there, and they did not allow me, I had no portfolio or anything, and they did not allow me to feel included. James E. Boudreau directed himself and out of his way to let me know I was out of place. This was a place where you learned to be a professional. You didn't learn to draw there. I was out in one year. And then, then you went on to, from there, you went to Brown. Well, well the, I found out about Cooper Union, Union right. because right. And, and the year I went to Cooper Union, Milton Glazer was there, and, uh, and, and uh, Reynold Ruffins was there. They came in after me. I had been there the year before, made the same bad record as I did at Pratt. It was a little bit better because they had more fun. It was in the village in New York. And so also, it was a better school, and there was more painting, it was more this and that. So I got a lot out of it. But I was still coming in when I feel like, because I didn't feel I was included. And so that was the first year I was there, 46, 45. Yeah, 46. And then the next year, Milton Gang was there. all these kids from the, from, the, from the whatever the high school was at art. And so this great group of people. And 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 frankly, there's a lot I could say about that year and that time, but I'm not gonna say it. What I am gonna say is <laughs> what I am gonna say is by the time 1950 came and I was 24 years old, I had decided I was not gonna be an artist. It was just too much. And, and so I was, been, that's why I went to City so College you're, we, we, we're, to teach. Okay, now, so now as an educator and as an illustrator, combining your love of history and uh, the knowledge of what children need to see to, to be identified, to see themselves. Uh, when you started in the industry, uh, there were very few pictures at all of uh, Blacks or any minorities, I'm, any I'm, other I'm, 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 so we take feel, the time. And I'm, we only got 10 take, minutes. You, got ten, ten, you only have 10 more minutes? That's all. <laughs> <laughs> we got a lot of ground to come. We got 70 years to come, and I want to make sure that the audience knows that you were also involved as an activist and, and, and bringing other artists into this field in terms of the Council of Interracial Books. I'm going to make a real effort. In the 60s. <laughs> and, Good. I was thinking Yeah, too. in the 60s. Uh, the number of people as an illustrator, you published uh, your book, Freddie Found a Frog. That's very important. The same year that John Steptoe. I'm not going to interrupt you because yeah, I hear where you're going. The same as John, as when John Steptoe published Stevie, which was a similar book. It was before he was writing books, before Ezra Jack Keats won uh, many awards for the snowy day. And some people think of that as a black book, but he, it's not a black book in terms of the authenticity and oh, the story behind it. it. So, okay, so I'm, on board. I'm, I'm on board. board. I'm on board. Here's Seven the back story. I'm, I'm going to give you the back story because it looks like you all know the whole the front story. <laughs> okay, Julie. <laughs> <Jerry. laughs> the, the first black uh, images in books is usually mentioned the snowy day. And I remember and this is the snowy day when the first snowy day first came out. 1962. That's 1962. I remember thinking people thought that, the, that, that it was that way because a black child on the cover, because the artist must be black. They figured no, nobody white would do it because they understood that the reason why they weren't black images in books was because it costs a lot to do a children's book. There's color, there's this. And the industry understood falsely that their audience is white because black folks don't read. Their subject matter is white because black culture is not important to highlight. Even though jazz and all this other stuff is being co-opted and being kind of ruined, as American culture. And so we know the backstory. It's demeaning to a white person to be led by a black person. Simple. So therefore, you were not gonna have black images on in books, period. I remember <clears throat> that I thought, why is this book being called the first book with a black with black, and they didn't realize that it was about snow. It was not about the boy. 
when I remember that Ernie Critchlow had done a book in 1941, or two, called Two as a Team. I think Random House must have died. <laughs> but it was about a white boy and a black boy who were friends, and it was called Two as a Team, and everybody black that I knew knew about the book. Ernie Critchlow, very yeah. famous painter. I also had a book. Mary Jane by Dorothy Sterling. Dorothy Sterling was, she, she was a little older. She was born in 1913. <clears throat> but she was part of the Renaissance, Black, Black Renaissance. So she had many books. And Mary Jane was, I had the book. This is long before any of this. It was not for kids. It was a young girl. But Paul Marshall, <clears throat> lived in Brooklyn, and Paul Marcia was my age. And she had written Brown Girl, Brown Stones in the 50s, 1953. And she was a neighbor. See, God puts me where the happenings are. So I just know it's different. I know it's wrong. So uh, I also, Jake Lawrence did Harriet and the Promised Land. Ernie Crislow did two as a team. The books that were done were not done by illustrators, professional illustrators. They were done by artists who filled the need. So I, I, I realized uh, <clears throat> that it's true. When uh, uh, you, you move me along, and I'll tell you what happened in, uh, in, in, in the 60s. Everything I'm telling you about is the is 50s. This is before Snowy Day. We have a culture, we have it, but why is it not known? Because the industry itself is excluding it, silencing it, it's not important, they wanna keep it that way. So the Council on Interracial Books for Children is an organization started by, well, Brad Chambers was white and he was an editor, a right thinking person, a GWF, great white folks. I knew him, and I read in the Publishers Weekly, in public, he had done an article called Children's Book Publishing, colon, a racist clown. Put the highlight on it, ostracized. That's why he connected with all these black people who realized that the organization is not white. Editors, teachers, librarians, and we had the bulletin organized by them. It was a black organization. Two years after I joined, Brad, who was a right-thinking person, said, you know, I'm white and I'm president of this black organization. So they, they asked me to be president because I had nothing better to do <laughs> except artwork and trying to get into the publishing industry. By this time, however, I had done a book. And the book was the book I did was with Viking Press, which accepted, was ready to go. And I could go to about half an hour on Viking. But I found out they had. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it's, it's great. I want you to talk about Freddie Found a Frog and the impact of that, because we really only have two minutes. I want to let the audience know that prior to uh, this conversation, we have had so many conversations before. There's a YouTube interview with uh, George Ford. Uh, and Just Us Books, that and, and Burnett Ford, his wife, who's also a major mover in the children's book industry. But I want George to talk about Freddie Found the Frog okay. and what we want to do moving forward, because there will be a podcast later with George, who has, is talking for two hours on one question. <laughs> it really did go fast. I'm really it's, sorry. It's, I'm, no, I'm really sorry. sorry. You've got because, some great since, information. Since, since, Walking since, history. Okay. Since you mentioned it, this actually happened. You may remember that, that the, 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 the 60s really started across the country, the organization that, that had brought children into community centers, you know, to make them more conscious of their, of their heritage and so on. One of them was Caribou House in Cleveland. And when the story day came out in 1962, in 1969, a small company, Van Nost and Reinhold, submitted a, a story to me, Freddie found a file about a kid in an urban area 
who finds it in a pool, a puddle, a of, of all things in the city, a frog. He brings it home and all that. I, I, I know that the oil also was white. And I know that it was intended that I would have done a white person if I was disposed to do that. But I didn't come here to do white people. I came in to do whatever I come from. And I had it from the beginning of childhood. A lot of people were doing things that were expected. So I never even thought of it. So it's a really real presentation of a child in my neighborhood, Bedford Stuyvesant. Then I was living in Bedford Stuyvesant. And, and his mother is a good looking young woman. Uh, the house is a brownstone. And the puddle is in the back, and he brings the frog home, and it's a it's, it's a Caramel House called me. They saw the book, and I took all of my stuff. Took the first time visiting the school with the kids, and that was hooked for life. That they're my new family. I don't have to get married or anything. I took the book out, and I had the originals, and I had Snowy Day also. And I held it, this is snowy day. He says, we saw that, we saw that. <laughs> <laughs> then I stood up with the same mama and said, boy, dark, you know, lively, and his mother, and, and, and said, so they were kind of crazy. They really loved it. So from then on, I see this. The personal purpose of our working, why we do this, is not for the glory and not even for the self-expression, and not certainly not for the celebrity. We do it because we're trying to create the kind of person who would do what Cheryl and Wade did. The kids who are confident, and it's worse now than it was when I was a kid. It's blatant now, and the judges are on their side. So it's more important for us now to remember, and Eric knows this better than anybody, and so I'm glad you're here today, because he's lived in both worlds the way I did. We are the only ones that can do it, because we're the only ones who want to do it. And as soon as this book banning started, <clears throat> and I could see clearly, this is a way to silence the voices before they start. <laughs> if they don't have books, then, then the reason we work won't be there. They want us to be wanting the glory and wanting acceptance. Right. Forget acceptance. My new hero is Fanny Willis. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to do a post of Fanny Willis for president. I, I, was, I was looking for somebody who was saying, you better not testify because everybody's saying Fanny Willis had him by the grapes. By the, by the grapes. That's the <laughs> <laughs> right, so, so, and then they, they got to Fanny Willis because they said, they found she had a boyfriend. It doesn't everybody. <laughs> anyway, I want to too. finish with this. Okay. I don't want to take anybody's time. Okay. Okay. This is it. This is what the, the game is. You know, she was too good. She actually had handcuffs in her hand, and they found a way to give her a flaw. So she gets the blame for being flawed. She got on the stand yesterday and she prosecuted them from the stand. <laughs> she said, you think I'm a criminal? You are the criminal. You are the I said to myself, my girl. She, 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 she even looks like a girl I used to know. Okay, no. no, no. <laughs> Give it up for George. <laughs> With the podcast, we got so many stories and so many things. Yeah, everybody would be standing up right now for George Ford. Without George Ford, there would not be just such books. Every last where we can read the general public, one of the other would not be here. So let's give him his due. Okay. <laughs> Get to the mic now. <laughs> oh, did you hear me? Yeah. I forgot I had the mic in my hand.
Yeah, I'm going down as hard as it comes. Yeah, I know. I'm right. Hey, what's up? It's good to see you again. <laughs> I just recognize you in the previous. Everyone, I get to follow Uncle George. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm Katora Hudson. I read, write, and love children's books. And today I'm excited to lead a conversation about creating books for young readers with we have three amazing authors and illustrators here. Unfortunately, Valerie Wilson Wesley is under the weather and won't be able to join us. Um, Sharon Dennis Wyatt, whose award-winning books for children and young adults include the picture book, Something Beautiful, and her recent release, The River and Me. Denise Lewis Patrick, author of over 30 books for young people, including Medea's Old Green House and a, house name, and a Girl Named Rosa. Eric Velasquez, who's illustrated more than 30 books, including Schomburg, The Man Who Built a Library, and Grandma's Gift, which he wrote and illustrated. Jessup's book has had the honor of collaborating with and publishing each of these talented creators in titles including Book of Black Heroes from A to Z, Medea's Old Green House, The Talk, and Recognize. And on Facebook this week, I saw a post from Nikki Grimes, who's an amazing poet and author. It said, picture books are hard. Creating a world characters readers will care about, an engaging plot line, doing research and sketches, revisions, lots of revisions, and keeping everything kid-friendly and usually under 32 pages, not easy at all. And that might be surprising to hear because they're short books, but no surprise for our panelists. So we'll be talking about all of that, the creative process, getting published, and more, and we will have time for questions from the audience. Okay. Let's start at the very beginning. Sharon, when did you first discover your creative talent and how did you nurture it? Well, I was thinking, I thank you for uh, sending the questions because it has made me really think about a lot of my work. I've been doing this for 30 years or more and have many, many books and they were all uh, a labor of love in some sense and very important to me. Now, just before we came in here, uh, we were all kind of talking, having a wonderful, well, I was meeting some great people for the very first time and then others I know. So it was like a reunion in the green room. And we, we talked about children and the importance of what we're doing and I think that I can probably say that maybe not just me, it was like they were born to do it. Uh, I think I was born to write, and I was born to write what I'm writing because I had choices and I made my choice. I had I was lucky enough to have choices and I made the choice I wanted to make. Um, early on, when you talk about nurturing or recognizing your talent, I don't know whether uh, we have a a way of conceptualizing what talent is when we are 
I don't know, before we go to school, before somebody starts giving us lessons, before somebody says to us, oh, you're very talented. But I think that uh, I certainly do, and I think some of my uh, fellow artists have memories that go way, way back. I remember bragging about my talent. I didn't know how to write yet, but I knew how to talk at the age of two. And I was very noisy, and I was very proud of my ability to know words. This is when I was learning how to talk. It's one of my early memories, running around uh, and, you know, in the apartment uh, in Washington, D.C., and my mother sitting on a bed chatting with my godmother, her, her, her uh, best friend. And I guess my mother was 17 when I was born, so she's probably 20, but a 20 year old young woman. And I'm saying, I know the word for mop. I know the word for broom. I know the word for Aunt Connie, meaning my, my godmother. I know the word for book. I was bragging about my words. And of course, they, you know, they loved it. They liked a noisy child. They liked a person who loved language. The printing press was, it, it was a long time coming. And people, not everybody had books for a long, long time. Writing or language is spoken first. And we remember things in, in voice. And so for me, the, my first experience of being a writer, in a sense, was being a speaker, being a person who had a voice. And I think that when you listen to George, uh, what he had to say, I was just riveted. So much of it has to do with don't silence my vision, don't silence my emotions, don't erase my experiences, and don't you dare tell me to shut up. <laughs> and I think, so that, I, in a sense, is what I did. I, whenever I had an opportunity, uh, to write later on. My parents taught me how to, um, they nurtured my joy of language. They taught me how to read before I went to school. They taught me how to write. I grew up in DC during segregation, I guess the year, uh, you know, it was it was ending. Uh, legally it was ending, but I, 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 was, I grew up in the black community. And my teachers who were all black teachers until I went to junior high, uh, were extraordinary people. I remember them all, and I remember all of the opportunities that they offered to me. I went to eight different public elementary schools when I was a little girl in Washington, D.C. All my teachers were Black teachers, and when I would walk into the room, they didn't put me to the side. They didn't sit me in the back. They didn't ignore me and pretend like I wasn't there. They said, come on up here, little girl. Let me see how far you're reading. And expecting that I had that skill already. Um, so nurturing doesn't come in a vacuum. It's something that we learn from the people who are around us, our, our families, our peers later on, and our teachers. Um, the opportunities that were offered to me were amazing in these various schools. Not only was I put in my own reading group at some point because I was reading so much. Why did, why did that happen? Because there was a library around, a public library. I got my library card at the age of four. I was too young to get it, but I can remember it. Standing there, not even tall enough to reach the desk. But my mother was with me, of course, and I was allowed to get my card. And I was taken to the library and later on, I went by myself. I went to eight different elementary schools, but I went to the same library and I took out books. And that is how I learned to nurture myself through reading widely, which I still do. And absolutely, and way over my head. <laughs> but I, I absolutely, and I still do that too, which I absolutely loved. Um, third grade, I had my first publication. Why do I bring that up? Not because I'm you know, boasting about myself because I remember it. I remember the teacher kneeling behind me and putting her shoulder, her hand on my shoulder, looking at my three lines that I had written about pilgrims going to Plymouth Rock in third grade and saying, 
Would you mind if we put this in the school magazine? Mm. Respect. I remember that. I said, of course I said yes. What could I say? And you said, uh -huh, yes. And I still have that magazine. Another school, fourth grade. The principal comes to me and a friend who's in my class and says, we don't have a school newspaper here. Would you like to start a newspaper? And of course I said yes. And I remember the act of doing it. All of this is nurturing, but it's not done in a vacuum. And it went on. Fifth grade, I wrote a play by myself, still a new school. I bring the play in to the teacher. It's all about a girl who, an American girl, uh, a black girl, which I am, even though I don't look like I am to most people, but that's who I was, that's who I am. And she wanted to go, she met some people from a town in Africa, unnamed. Well, they liked hula hoops, and so did she. And those people invited her to go to their country to participate in a hula hoop contest. I wrote the play. Next thing you know, everybody in my class had a part. We were on the stage, the whole school was there, all the parents were there, and everybody was doing a hula hoop in an African garb. It was fantastic. Never forgot that. So saying yes to opportunities is a way that that one is um, that one nurtures oneself. I want to I'm I'm gonna stop now because I think I've taken enough time with that, but you know, I, I did want to um you know, I love the question, nurturing oneself, and as an adult, and when you're a young adult, you, you know how to do that and what that means, going to the library, reading research, you know, being curious. But children uh, depend on others, depend on parents, teachers, grandparents, to teach them and to set examples of nurturing. And uh, that's what I, that's what, you know, stood out for me when I thought about the question. So thank you, um, Eric. I want to turn it over to you from the illustrator's perspective. Um, so when did you first discover your creative talent? How did you know? Well, I, I started drawing at about the uh, age of seven or so. Uh, but I come from a family that had a strong storytelling tradition. And it's a tradition that I wanted to pay um, homage to in my book, Octopus Stew. And I'm, it's a spoiler alert, but it's uh, when the gatefold opens, oh, wow. you see a family sharing stories. We have the um, grandpa comes over with his guitar, right? And then there's this little kid from my other book looking for bongo. He's there with his bongo drums and his sister's there with his, her, you know, bongo, the, uh, the stuffed animal. But here we have the cousin, like I had, that wanted to be a writer, and then the cousin that wants to be a photographer. That's basically was my family. Yeah. So we used to gather, tell stories, those that like to dance would dance, the latest dances. And so that's where I come from. Mm -hmm. So when I sit down to uh, either write a story or even illustrate even the words of others, I see it as part of that tradition that started in those living rooms with my grandmother and my, uh, my aunts, you know, just sharing stories and conveying, you know, different ideas to, to other people. And that's something that's still alive, you know, in my family today. So even my dad in his 80s is still sort of correcting my storytelling. Because even my, my storytelling mentor is like, I hey, Bob, you know, when I was parking, this, this guy just kind of stood right in front of the parking spot. And then there's this other guy that destroyed him. Oh, wait a minute. Which guy? Wait, you got too many characters. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, wait, start again. Okay, I came down 119th Street, Third Avenue. Okay, now you're going good. Keep going. You know? <laughs> but if you think about that, even in a visual sense, mm -hmm. it's it completely relates. Mm -hmm. You know, clarity, consistency. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so so that that's the tradition I go from. Wow. <laughs> so seven, two. I'm not going to ask you the same exact question, but I do want to know. We're going to ask Denise. Can you take us back to your first published book? What was it, and um, how did you land that book deal? Uh, my first published book was Red Dancing Shoes, a picture book. Yes. Um, I, 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 
the idea for it was it was really weird um, because when I first came to New York from my small town in Louisiana, I wanted to expand myself. So I thought I would find out about opera, you know, for no reason. <laughs> um, and I was in the balcony way up top at the Met. Um, and I don't even remember which opera it was, but there was a dancing sequence and they all came out and they had on red shoes. And I was in my twenties when I was like, I had red shoes. What happened with those red shoes? But, and so I went home and I actually wrote it like over a, a week because it's the story of, in the book, the girl is unnamed, her grandmother goes on a trip and brings presents back. And one thing that she brings for the character, the main character is a pair of red patent leather shoes, which I had. Um, and from there, it became a story about me, even though the child is unnamed, um, and going to show off her shoes. And the neighborhood is my neighborhood in Natchitoches, Louisiana. Uh, the people named are people from my childhood. Uh, we had a great aunt on one corner and a great aunt on the other corner. And around on the next block was were cousins. And so it was that kind of neighborhood and the child in the story goes to show the shoes off and falls down and gets her shoes muddy. I was a very clumsy child. I tripped, I fell, I still bump into stuff in my own house. So it was it was autobiographical in that way. Um, and one of the things I loved about it was I was the oldest, so I gave myself a big sister. That was the first time I realized that with writing, you can do those things. Yeah. And so I did. But I wrote the story and didn't do anything with it. And a friend of mine who was also worked at Golden, she said, and, and my husband, who is here, said, you need to do something with your stories. I was working as an editor. And um, my friend called me one day and said, I found you an agent. I said, what are you talking about? She said, and I told her all about you, so you need to send her that story. She's waiting to hear from you. I gave her your number. I said, why are you doing <laughs> So I did. And as we know from being in this industry, what happened hardly ever happens, never happened again for about 20 years. She got red dancing shoes. She sold red dancing shoes. I made money the first royalty period off red dancing shoes. And I didn't know, and that's not really how it goes. But I, you know, I kept on. And so it was a great encouragement and it was wonderful because it was a story out of me. Um, and I realized that that's the source of a lot. However, it actually comes out, even if I'm doing nonfiction, I'm in there. And so that's that's how that happened. So did something, cool. did something with that story. I did something with that story, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, well, Eric, what about you? When did you do something with those stories and, and land your first book? Okay, so I was illustrating... Um, uh, book covers for about the first 12 years of my career. And then I, I did Piano Man, which won the uh, Scott King, John Steptoe Award, which I'm very proud of. And then by the time I was on my third book, I, I wrote Grandma's Records. And, and that came about by just, once again, I was having a conversation with a friend on the phone. He's like, you have a great idea that you should write it down. And then I, I pitched the idea to, to, my, um, to my editor, Emily, Emily Easton at um, Walker Bloomsbury. And that was the, the first um, book that I, that I wrote and illustrated, which is it's a whole story onto itself, how, how, I got, how I got it, you know, in that I had written it and I had to do Emily a favor because I... I was under contract to do a, my, my fourth book, and I won't name the author, but the author didn't have the manuscript ready. And she said, listen, um, basically, it, do you have anything? You know, because she said, I have to deliver a book to my editor in chief, you know, the, the mm -hmm. honcho, the company. I said, as a matter of fact, <laughs> I have something. So understanding opportunities, absolutely. Um, so I, I, I showed her the manuscript and 
you know, the rest is history. And, and just I want to I want to take you back a right. little bit because I'm I'm thinking we probably have some aspiring artists in the yeah. crowd that usually are. How did you get the deals to even illustrate the covers? That that's how you started, right? Well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so that. Once I graduated from the School of Visual Arts, I had a portfolio, and back then you had to make uh, cold calls. You had to call, um, you know, the the uh, art directors, and usually you speak into what they used to call secretaries back then, and they would either have you drop off the portfolio, and then you had to pick it up. <laughs> it just had like this cold letter inside, you know, we're no longer, we're not interested in your in your art, or it would have like that magic little card that says call tomorrow at 10 a.m. or something like that. Uh, but that's how I started my career. So I already had a lot of contacts in publishing. So by the time I got to Piano Man, um, it, it was because I had done book covers for the same company. But always be prepared for the young, aspiring uh, artists, you know, always be prepared, prepared and understand opportunities when, when they present themselves. Yeah. So this is a question for all of you. You've been writing and illustrating for years. We won't say how many years, but years. Um, the industry has changed. The way readers access books has changed. And you all have probably changed too. Um, has your creative process evolved as well? Sure. Um, I, I think that over the years, the main thing that's changed in my process, um, I had to recognize I'm a very visual person. I'm, I'm a wannabe artist, but I've never <laughs> illustrated any of my own work. But I think visually. And so I have begun writing scenes rather than, you know, I have the idea for the entire story. Again, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, my own, or I'm, you know, doing a, a book that someone has asked me to do. And um, I, think of it very visually now as I am crafting the book. And that's different from me deciding, okay, this is sort of what I want to do for the beginning. This is the end. This, and, and I discovered that on a project where I kept beginning it and that wasn't it. And so I would write some more and that wasn't the beginning. And then I would write some more and that, and then I got, I was like, I don't know how long I had been writing. And I was like, oh, this is the beginning. So this scene goes here, and then the other things went in, they, they were used, but they went in different places. And I had never thought like about storyboarding. It was like, but my brain was doing it. Mm. Yeah, and um, so that has sort of become the way I approach things now, which was very different. Interesting, fascinating, a little scary, but now I accept it and it, it works for me. So yeah, that's that's a big change for me in process. Anyone else want to tackle that question, how your process has changed? Well, I think that, um, I mean, thinking about listening to you Paul, and uh, just kind of thinking about the question this morning when I when, you, when I saw it might be closed, uh, it really depended very much on how, how quickly uh, the book had to be done um, whether or not someone solicited a particular kind of manuscript. And also, there's another bucket. This is a book I really want to write. Mm -hmm. This is something I really want to write. I have stories from my family. I want to incorporate. This is history that I want to know more about because I want to know more about it for myself. And so, therefore, I'm going to be writing this book, but also teaching myself. And those kinds of books are take have taken much, much longer. These kind of personal quest books that you, and also triggered by family and collective family history from grandparents, great grandparents, research. They take they, they have taken longer. Now I was um, listening to uh, Denise uh, talk about the visual. I I always can visualize very much so, but I have the um, I guess it goes with the first story I told you about the words and the sound of the words. I really think in sound, uh, in language, uh, spoken language. And I could stand up here, I did it the other day, and I have a book that hasn't sold yet, and it's really big. It's, it's 300 pages long. I mean, usually they're 150 pages, and it incorporates a, a, a whole 
family locale in the mountains that I'm familiar with and stories from World War I in my family and other things. And um, it's quite something. I got very immersed. It took me a long time to write it because I was at the computer and I was writing and writing. And then I would read it over and I'd go, oh, 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 you know, the first line here, Ella was at the well and a rush of robins arrived. Oh yes, oh yes, a rush of robins. Yeah, yeah. Going back over and over the language. And the other day I had a book didn't sell. Um, not too many people have seen it. And then I said to my husband, you know, the problem is that I have to sit there at the computer because it's a different process from actually speaking. And now that I have constructed the whole book, I could stand up right now and I could probably recite to you and tell you the entire book using some of that beautiful language that I came up with. So I'm thinking myself that I need to somehow um, try to, because it becomes a habit. You're sitting there and your hands are moving and it's very cerebral. Even though you're feeling and thinking, when you're actually talking, and telling the story, it's such a so much more immediate connection. So I'm trying to kind of harness that more, and instead of trying to be so perfect in my writing, so perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Anything share? Uh, sure. Well, my process has been like the same <laughs> for many years now, and I'll just show. At one of the school visits that I did, one of the uh, uh, kids asked me, uh, which was like an amazing question no one had ever asked, how do you write the stories? Do you write it like in a in pencil or do you type it first? Yeah. You know, and, well, I, uh, you know, for 20 years of school visits, it's like this, no one had asked me that before. So the answer is uh -huh. I write it out in pencil uh -huh. and these sketchbooks. So I concern myself only with the story first to answer the question about process, mm. right? And once it's written out, then I start doing like the character sketches and start trying to find what they look like. Um, then I type it out, editor gives their comments, revisions, mm -hmm. but then I continue to develop the story, you know, with the storyboard sketches uh, for the entire 32 pages. Um, if I start by typing first into the computer, the problem there for me is it'll crash <laughs> or something else will happen. Uh, you know, the program won't open and now it's lost. Pencil, paper, oh, it works. You know, school. <laughs> that's also, the funniest thing for me is that I remember because I worked at Scholastic. Uh -huh. And I remember when Scholastic went from typewriters to computers. Uh -huh. They got some of the first apples in there, and they had a tech person that they embedded in our editorial yeah. department because none of us knew anything about right. that. And it took me a long time to be comfortable composing, and that was news writing, on the computer. So I also write poetry. That's what I started writing when I was like seven years old. And years after I was using the computer for work and for writing books, I couldn't write a poem, first draft a poem on the computer. I, I just couldn't do it. And so I would hand write my poems wherever I was and then type them up. Right. And I finally got to the point where I could do, do that and then I discovered notes on the phone. Oh, yes. yes. So <laughs> I can compose poetry on notes yep. on my phone. And I have also gotten bits of stories that I'm working on. If I'm stuck trying to move through, and I put that in notes on the phone and emailed it to myself. Nice. So it's, 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 yeah. Yeah. You know, it's a weird thing, the way your brain works. And when I say that to young people, they look at me like crazy. I said, I, I couldn't compose a poem. I, couldn't do it. I had to do it by hand. Right. 
And now if I get stuck, I still do take out a, a pad right. and, and a number two pencil, there you go. sharpen it up, and I will write pages that to get me it's past a point. Right. Yes, and then type it all yeah. up. So, I, I also so. um, do a lot, I mean, because I, I, I didn't talk too much about the actual manual process, depending on the on the book, how quickly it has to be done. But I have writer's journals, mm -hmm. and those of you in the audience who are writers probably have had books that you write down. And it's wonderful when you go to schools. And nowadays, kids have writer's journals when they're learning in, right. in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And it's great. But I have many of them. And I um, will start uh, in a very sketch-like way with language. Mm -hmm. But then uh, I I found that if I, um, if I make a decision about what I'm going to be working on the next day, and I say, I'm going to work now, let's say if I'm rewriting, I'm going to chapter one and I'm going to look at the character of Ella and when we see her and what she's saying. I mean, if I can, if I think that's something that needs work and if I can do that, it really is, if I can concentrate on one area of the book, I'm going back to the beginning of chapter one. You know, I'm going to the, the end, I'm gonna write several endings. This is when you're in the process, when you've, but I find writing things down in a, in a journal to keep track of what I'm doing is helps me uh, not to become overwhelmed and also to view it as a piece of work. You know, when you were talking about the, the change from the typewriter and we're talking about the notebooks or pencil and paper, which we all three of us use, I mean, it, it, it kind of clicked for me a little bit that the distance that I described in from speaking the story and feeling the story to actually writing it down with the computer, we have such a, a, a very facile opportunity for correction. And so it's almost like censoring, you know, oh, that doesn't sound as good. Do we, do we, do we? They all go Do we, do we, do we? You know, and when, when I was using a typewriter, you couldn't do that now. Mm -hmm. You have to think before you not speak, but write. And then when you go back and edit, you have to you have to really be choice there because you're using that whiteout. Yes. And or else you're tearing it up and going, oh, okay. Start all over again on that page. And I think there is something that's so quick and easy in a sense. See, yeah. uh, I never believe. And I tell my students, writing students, if I have something that I don't like or it's not working, I pull it out, I give it a title, I save it, and I put it aside because too many times I have deleted and it's like, if I only could remember yes. that thing, that, that belongs here. And that's part of the scene that you put yeah. in here. It belongs here. And so I, I no longer delete. And, and I've told students too. Don't delete just because you don't like it or you can't figure out what to do with it. Wait, save it, put it somewhere so you're not looking at it again, knowing it's not working, but you might be able to pull some of that to use it somewhere else. And it, it took me a long that's time a, to train idea. myself to do that, Yeah, but that's now what I do. And then when I finish a draft that I know it's pretty finished, then I can get rid of the other stuff, but I usually doubt it's still in the I, I do the same thing, and I have so many miscellaneous, like, yeah, just say yeah. miscellaneous, and yeah. I don't know what they, for years ago, but, well, no. the miscellaneous for me to fill in the same file with their project, so at least I could find that, but anyway. <laughs> so, um, we know it can be hard to pick a favorite, but I've asked them to, and I give them a heads up on this one. Can you share with us one of your favorite passages, either that you've written or for Eric, that you've um, illustrated and why it means so much to you. Anyone can go first. Go oh, no. <laughs> okay, well, I have to say it's not 30 seconds. Okay. I tried, I tried. That's a okay. um, One second, I have it marked here. Um, and I'll just read it and I'll tell you why it's my one of my favorites. I hate being asked that question too. It's like asking which one of my kids is my favorite, which I will never name. Okay. <laughs> Something white appeared just over the top of the hill. Midnight threw the gate open and stepped out. It was the top of a big white bundle. 
A slender black coffee hand appeared, lightly held against the bundle. Then her face, a dark egg shape. She had a long neck and wore a faded calico dress with a muslin apron. The bundle of clothes was balanced on her head. She seemed to be inside her own thoughts, not seeing what was ahead. Mama? She came back from her faraway world at the sound of his voice and stopped. Her eyes drank him up. Midnight bowed his head like a little boy when she raised a trembling hand to touch the kerchief he wore twisted at his neck. On the night of his escape, she had ripped the edge of her dress off and tied it there around Midnight's throat. You keep me with you all this time, my Midnight son? Always, Mama. So that's one of my favorite passages in the sequel to The Adventures of Midnight Sun. Uh, this is The Longest Ride, the sequel. And it's my favorite because he has spent this entire book searching for his mother at the end of the Civil War and, and has found her. But the scene itself is meaningful for two reasons. One is, this is actually my mother's story. She, uh, when she was a little girl, her grandmother, they lived all of them, multiple generations together. Her grandmother worked as a domestic at the college in town. And they took, she took in laundry from the girls on the side. And my mother said they knew what time she was supposed to come home and they would run out and stand in the middle of the street and wait to see the bundle because she tied the clothes up that was on her head coming up over the hill before they wow. saw her. And she talked about this memory a lot when I was a kid. And so that scene is my mother's memory. The description of Midnight's mother came, it was something I held for a long time from meeting uh, the Eritrean mother of a friend of mine who was visiting New York when my son who was in here was a little boy, was his friend's grandmother. And we went to meet her and she was in the kitchen roasting coffee beans on top of the stove. That's her, that's what she looked like. And she was so beautiful to me and so striking to me that her, that visual memory stayed with me. And when I had to decide what his mother looked like, I knew that was what his mother looked like. So it, it's a combination of all of that that makes that really memorable mm -hmm. to me. So thank you. Thank you. Ready to hear your favorite or one of? Yeah. Yeah, I yeah, know. That was hard. You know, I was looking at the, I said, okay. No, I have a, a book that came out last year, Juneteenth, Our Day of Freedom, and I really, it was a great, great experience for me to do uh, history and then contemporary celebration and to find the bridge. And I loved that book. And so I, I was torn. But I, I thought, I, in terms of something to share, I thought I would read just a teeny little bit about from something beautiful. And this is a book that I think has been in print for 25 years now. Uh, and I'll tell you why it's so meaningful to me. So in the first, um, which we have the illustration, Chris K. Sukic in the illustrations, is a fantastic artist also. When I look through my window, I see a brick wall. There's trash in the courtyard and a broken bottle that looks like fallen stars. And then I'll skip a little. I run past a dark alley where mommy told me I must never stop. Behind a fence, there's a garden without any flowers. Mommy said that everyone should have something beautiful in their life. Where is my something beautiful? And then finally, the teacher taught me the word in school. I wrote it in my book. B-E-A-U-T-I-F-U-L. Beautiful. I think it means something that when you have it, your heart is happy. And then the book uh, continues, uh, the picture book continues with the little girl uh, walks through the her neighborhood asking uh, 
various people what their something beautiful is. And so this place, this neighborhood becomes uh, a place of beauty and joy and also community. Adults and children, friends, uh, people who look after her. When I first, it's meaningful uh, to me, very much so, and there are several things attached to it that are personal. First of all, I, I grew up, uh, well, first frame, you can't see it, but when I look through my window, I see a brick wall, there's trash in the courtyard, a broken bottle that looks like fallen stars. That was not my childhood. I had a very tempestuous and difficult childhood because of my parents' marriage, but and loving, uh, loving grandparents on both sides. Um, I did I, I, I did see those certain things in my neighborhood that were scary to me. They weren't that great, but that was not my neighborhood. When I was, uh, I got a writing job before I went into uh, college, actually. I, I was a writer for the government. Uh, I wrote for Vista Volunteer Magazine. I was hired as a secretary. Then I started correcting to, to the writers of the magazine. And I began to do that copy editing for them. And one day, one of them said, I think you should be writing yourself. So I was sent on an assignment to uh, write a story about a young architect who was in Vista. And he was in a place in New York City where the landlord had neglected uh, this building. And people were living there, tenants, and they were trying to get changes made. And they weren't able to do it. And I walked into a, 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 an apartment, and there was a little girl there and a mother. And, you know, it could have been my apartment when I was growing up, but I looked out the window and I saw what was going on. There was so much refuge that had been left, that landlord had neglected the exterior. And I looked out and it's like, I never forgot that image. And um, that, that somehow stuck with me. So this was a very important uh, kind of beginning uh, for the book my own personal memory that was embedded uh, in the book was in kindergarten, going to my school in Washington, DC. Um, I already knew how to write my name, but I didn't know how to write anything else really. I knew how to read. And the teacher wrote that word up on the board, beautiful. And I never forgot it because she made an assumption and there was no judgment that some people might be able to write the word. And we were in kindergarten. And she said, and for those of you who would like to draw, you can draw something beautiful. And if anyone would like to write the word. And I remember the act of writing it. And it was a struggle, you know. It was really a struggle, copying the, the but it was such an, an amazing experience. And again, there was this person, the teacher, who somehow was treating us with such respect. There was no judgment if you didn't know how to write, but it, perhaps you did. And here are the supplies. <laughs> that was the first thing that ever happened. So I, I um, that is embedded in it, and it was very important to me also. Um, when I first wrote this book, I began writing it because that word beautiful really stuck with me. As I told you, I had a very difficult childhood moving around and stuff. And when I would feel um, alone and frightened walking up to these various schools that were new all the time by myself, I would spell the word beautiful out in my mind. And it was like a mantra to me. And at one point when I had my own alley in the back of my apartment where there was some trash, I was really unhappy because I was moving so much. I said to my mother, can I have something beautiful, please? So I can put it on my windowsill. So I was about seven. I don't have to look at the trash outside. And she gave me a little vase. And uh, it was one of her wedding gifts. She had it in a shopping bag in the closet because she was running away from my father. And, you know, all that kind of horrible domestic stuff was going on. And she gave this thing to me and I put it on my windowsill and I called it my something beautiful. Well, I still have the object. And when I first started writing the book, it was about the object. 
and we talk about process, I had to write it over and over again. The object got lost, the object got broke, the object was in a fire, the object this, the object that. And one time there was an editor who was interested in my work and she said, can you tell me who this book is really about? And it just suddenly dawned on me. It was, it was about the child. And the object's not in the book anymore. You know, so that's why um, these passages in this book are so uh, important to me. One last thing I will say is that when I had the opportunity to have this book published, I was doing a uh, visiting writer it was a volunteer author uh, visit. I was a volunteer uh, in New York City, and I went to a school in the Bronx, and I I tried the book out. I, I previewed the book with the classroom that I had been visiting once a month, and you know, it hadn't been published, and it, but this was the version, more or less. And I said, I'd like for you to listen to this and to give me your honest opinion. So I read it, and the neighborhood was a neighborhood that was very much like the neighborhood that opens the book, where there was a lot of neglect for, by landlords, was very, very urban with every all the trimmings. And uh, I I read it, and I was I was I was afraid because I did not want to shame the people that are going to read this book. I wanted people to feel proud of their neighborhood in spite of the fact that there might have been trash in the courtyard, uh, not ashamed. And that was what I was looking for, utter silence. I read the book, very lively group. They knew me, nothing, utter silence. And then one child, it was a boy, he raised his hand and he said, I'm in the book. Mm -hmm. It was, Amazing, amazing. So that's why I'm sure. Um, I want to go to Eric, but I just want to let everyone know we're going to open it up for questions after Eric shares his. So if you have questions, please raise your hand. I'll tough action follow. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to just read a couple of pages from Octopus Stew, and it'll become kind of self evident why I'm reading it. So grandma buys the octopus because she's going to make octopus stew. And so I'll skip right into this. So back home, grandma unwrapped the octopus, gave it a good scrubbing and put it in a pot of boiling water. And I did my best to stay out of her way. Then grandma came to sit with me while I did my homework. And all of a sudden, strange noises started to come from the kitchen. Blip, blip, blur, blip, blip, blur. Guess it, I asked so. What could that be? Uh, grandma asked. Ramsey, get out that key. Boy, I bet. Stay here. But the sounds got louder. Blip, blip, blur. Blip, blip, blur. And suddenly, the chunk. The octopus got so big, it blew the lid right off the pot. They got me out of Grandma. Watch out. I warned. Escondete, Grandma hollered. Hide. Thump, thump, thump. Blip, blip, blur. Thump, thump, thump. Vamos de aquí, I yelled. Let's get out of here. But it was too late. The octopus had gotten grandma. <laughs> <laughs> I grabbed my phone and hid until I could figure out how to rescue grandma. The octopus had to have a natural predator, something that it feared. I searched, and there it was. Sharks. I grabbed my drawing pad and markers and drew the biggest, meanest, scariest shark I could create. I put on my super ram cape and marched into the kitchen. You put down my grandma, I yelled. <laughs> the octopus uh, dropped grandma and attacked, spraying ink all over my drawing. <laughs> and this is where suddenly there's an interruption in oh, the story. Yeah. <laughs> And dad interrupted, okay, Miho, don't you think your story's getting a little too far-fetched? I mean, like, really, Ramsey? Hey, dad, you broke my concentration. You told me it was my turn to tell the story tonight. May I please continue? <laughs> my favorite is, just briefly, 
because the boy uses his intellect to figure out how to rescue his grandma and where he doesn't understand what can possibly scare the octopus, he, he uses his phone as an instrument, not as something to just go on social media, but he uses it as a tool, as an extension of his intellect. And he figures out, you know, he finds the answer that it's sharks. So that's why that's my favorite. And that's, some, that's the story I wanted to tell. Um, and, and in part that in young children that the, uh, you can use the phone for more than just Instagram. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Imagine that. Imagine that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. So if anyone has any questions for our panelists, our creators, please, Dad, you already have a question. <laughs> just raise your hand if you have any questions. If not, I have plenty of other questions. So I'll open it up. Any questions? Oh, shy. Sure. Hi, uh, this is really cool. Um, where do you think that the publishing industry is headed, I guess, in terms of diversifying children's literature? And I'll, I'll repeat that in the mic. Where do you think the children's um, in book industry is headed in terms of diversifying lit? Okay. I think we're already there. We, we are diversifying more than ever before. This is like perhaps the most diverse. This is, I believe, Pretty much what what George was saying. This is you know why the brakes are being put on 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 it, and why we're seeing the book bannings to sort of slow slow this tie down. Uh, but you know it's we'll I see. Would agree. I, I would agree. Yeah. I think I think it has become certainly more diverse than it was yeah. when I started out uh, several decades ago, <laughs> um, and to see the different types of books that a diverse group of authors and illustrators uh, is creating is fascinating to me too, for all age levels. Um, it, it's, there's something for like every child um, and every family, I think. And I think that's great. Yeah. I, I think that, um, you know, it's, uh, we are becoming even more, we're in a new wave of, uh, of a political discourse also. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fact that on the news this morning, there was uh, an educator who was being asked about the meaning or the perception of a permission slip being sent home um, to, to ask parents permission to read. A uh, to share a book in the yeah. classroom written yeah. by an African American author uh, during Black History Month, yeah. and so I'm, I may not, I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm misquoting. This was the idea. Yeah. Uh, so we're still, and and in terms of what George was saying, I mean, it was unbelievable um, how clear it was the way you just described. The closed, um, the closed club in prior decades uh, mm -hmm. in in children's literature. How how impossible it was to get an invitation to even show your work if you happen to be if your protagonist happened to be African American or people of color or if you yourself or primarily if the creator was person. I, I think that That's ties in. Different. That ties in completely with what George was yep. saying earlier. And my perspective is, so this is not new. We have been through this yes. before and we have persevered as, as creators uh, who value our stories and are determined to tell our stories and provide these stories for all kinds of children. I mean, that's been my thing. All kinds of children need to see all kinds of books Absolutely. by all kinds of people and by, about and by all types of people. Um, and I think we just, we have to stay the course. We Absolutely. have to encourage each other and encourage that younger generation who's coming up to tell their uh, stories from their perspective. Uh, but it, it is not new. Right. Um, and I think we have to remember that and we have to remember how far we have progressed and, and continue to do so. Sure. <laughs> One more question. You had a question? 
Oh, no, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, somebody back there has a question. Sure. Can... All right, you guys are fantastic, but uh, I have one question to ask. Um, I'm in the music, and I know I have what we call a music as a writer. So, how do you guys do this in the speed of you want? Do you do a good one? Do you do it all? Don't be the same. So, so, how, how do you um, tackle writer's speed? And I want to ask the brother, if you've never heard the term writer's block, would you have it? <laughs> because, <laughs> because if you pretend it doesn't exist, right, then it might not. It might be, you know, you're like suffering like a, a burnout. Maybe there's like a period where now you have to take in more, listen to more music, maybe listen to music from other cultures, you know, take in more. And then you're going to see that that just is going to regenerate, you know, your art. You know, I go through periods where it's like, you know, it's like a dry period. But then I go to museums. I'm reading more, you know, just taking in a lot. I'm going to movies. And the more I take in, the more I'm going to be inspired. And it kind of restarts the machine. Mm. You know, I, I was when I, when you asked that question, I think I heard my husband laughing over there <laughs> about what I do when I have writer's block. I sew things. Ah, uh, see, it, it's a, yeah, so and, and I I make dolls and they can be this tiny, or I'm making something to wear, or I'm making something for I my drag dolls about sewing so things. <laughs> yeah, so but it, it's it seems like it's such a total disconnect from writing, but it is also a process. And for me, it's a process that if I start to make a pair of pants, I know they're gonna be finished and I can make them fit the way I want to and do what I want to. And I have something that is complete. Whereas the, the thing I was blocked on is still sitting over there not finished. But this is something I can finish. I mean, it used to be like cooking something specific, like jambalaya or something, all of those steps that I know from by heart to do to make that the way my father made it, I know when I finish it, it's going to be what I want it to be. And so to me, it's kind of what you yeah. said too. Okay. It's doing something completely different on its face from the right. thing that I cannot do and in the moment. I so, have one, la one last little thing just for me. I would say, because um, I've, I've never had writer's block, but there have been periods where I've been waylaid with so many other things in my life. I felt overwhelmed. Having a specific time frame and a specific place that you go there and you sit and with your instrument or whatever, with low expectations, I'm just here with myself with my tools in my place, and I'm going to be here for 30 minutes, and that's it. Because I think we do put a lot of pressure on ourselves often to produce, to make it the best, to make it perfect, to be as perfect as, to, and um, creativity is kind of fickle in a way. Very. Yeah. So just have some time to practice, to practice, just think of it as practice. Mm -hmm. And, and we're, we're a little over, so I want to, but I think this question is, is important, so I want to ask you your question, your answer is pretty short if you can. What do you hope to achieve through the books you create? I want children to be able to ask, I want to um, kind of illuminate questions that children may have themselves, that sometimes they are afraid to ask. Sometimes people are reluctant to give them the answers to and to find the language that is accessible to them. And I, because that's what happened to me, I had a loving family, but I wanted to know all about my racial identity. I wanted to know why I looked different. I went, and when I would ask certain questions, people were nervous and they didn't want to give me any answers. And uh, there were a lot of things. Why is my father so angry all the time? Nobody could tell me. And, but these are things that we perceive when we, all of us here perceived these things when we were children. And children, we have, you know, have five senses and they listen, they look, <laughs> and they see what's happening in the reality and they might have questions. So I think that parents can read certain of our books 
share them with their children and have conversations on their level that they are able that that are reassuring, but also so they don't feel like they're in the dark. Yeah. Ask it one more time. But I want to make sure I'm answering. What do you hope what do you hope to achieve through the book you created? Yeah, I was gonna say that what I hope to achieve is that children who read my books began to understand that humanity is a shared experience. So as we live wherever we are, whoever we are, whoever we're with, uh, there are other people, no matter where they are and who they are, who are having the same kinds of yeah. experiences as, as you are, good, bad, whatever. And that's the, the just the shared humanity of our, our experiences. To inspire, uh, to have a child say, uh, I can write that. Uh, I can draw that. I want to be like that. That's it. That's really good. There's one more question. One more question. Sure. Very short question. Did any of you have any challenges in the overcome how to achieve other dreams? Ooh, that, that's, that might that's, be a question for, for after for the book yeah, signing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you wouldn't mind, yeah, thank you. I, I want to make sure that we have enough yeah, time okay. for our next yeah. panel. We have spoken word artists coming as well. So um, just to wrap up, author and friend to many of us here, Jacqueline Woodson said, each time we read, write, or tell a story, we step into the writer's circle and it remains unbroken and the power of story lives on. So thank you so much for sharing thank your you. stories with us. Yeah. Another round of applause for now on the penguins panel. So we're just going to take a little break so that we can set up the stage for our next presentation. So we'll give us about two minutes and we can be right back with you. Okay, uh, get ready to get started again. So we need you to get your seats. Thank you, Mr. Hudson. All right, let's get started. From haiku to hip hop, poetry conveys emotions, tells stories, and connects with readers and listeners of all ages and from all backgrounds. Please join me in welcoming educator, author, and artist, Tony Jackson, in the presentation of the school. Peace, everybody, peace. Uh, I'm so fed right now. I'm so fed right now, I feel so lifted. I feel like I am in a room surrounded by my heroes and I am so bolstered by everything that I'm hearing. So thank you so much, everyone that I'm hearing before. Um, and I wanna invoke another one of my heroes. You might be familiar with this. This helps me to get comfortable, hopefully. If you know it, you can sing along too, right? I sing this. Um, one of my favorite poets is Langston Hughes. Anybody heard of <laughs> Langston, okay. <laughs> And my favorite poem of Langston goes like this. This is how I hear it. Throning a drowsy, syncopated tune, rocking back and forth to a mellow crone. I heard a Negro play, I heard a Negro play. Down on Lenox Avenue the other night, by the pale dull pallor of an old gaslight. He did a lazy sway, he did a lazy sway to the tune of those weary blues. And with his ebony hands on each ivory key, he made that poor piano moan with melody. Sweet blues coming from a black man's soul. Oh, blues. Swaying to and fro on his rickety stool, he played that sad, raggy tune like a musical fool. Ain't got nobody in all this world. Ain't got nobody but myself. I was going to quit my frowning and put my troubles on the shelf. 
Thump, 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 with his foot on the floor. He played a few chords and he sang some more. I got the weary blues and can't be satisfied. Got the weary blues and can't be satisfied. I ain't no happy no more and I wish I had died. Died, died. And far into the night, he crooned that tune. The stars went out and so did the moon. The singer stopped singing and went to bed while the weary blues echoed through his head. He slept like a rock or a man that's dead. dead. Give it up for Langston Hughes. So I wanted to leave with that because I am so of Langston's ill that when I read that poem, I hear the rhythm in it. I feel the rhythm in it. And as an MC, I know that that is a bit of the DNA of the hip hop that is in me. So that is where it comes from. I want to always honor that. Um, I want to share something that I just wrote. You know, can I can I get a little snaps or something in here? So I'm trying to, this this can be a little nerve wracking, but in hearing the discussion of uh, the book bands that are going on, it truly is a battle that we're fighting. Uh, so I call this uh, let's call this sonnet in defense of the band. I love sonnets. I love the form. Excuse me. Let me just read. Here we go. <laughs> I pull up to the library with my army of speakers, we plug ourselves in. We pack the power to face and defy attempts to silence our voices or pins. You see these instruments? Play notes of change. He beat Rye in his rhythms with our drums. We resist the attempts to keep us caged and claim the right to say what is to come. This building is a hard rock house of blues. It holds these books that we hold essential. They seek to quiet and whitewash our hues, remove the holiness from our temple. Speakers, turn your volumes way up and stand, band together in defense of the band. And so I feel that it is important to to actively fight, to actively battle, and to make sure that, as, as was mentioned, this is our time right now. This is the time right now. I teach fourth grade, and my students are passionate readers. Every year I see that increase. Now, I'm, I'm getting better as a teacher, but I also know that the materials we have, the resources we have, the books that we are getting in, are amazing. We have a plethora of diverse voices represented within my classroom library. And if that were to change, it would be a travesty. So we have to be active in that defense. Uh, this is another sign. This is for another one of my heroes. This doesn't have a name. Um, but I'll call it LeVar Bird. <laughs> I was always less Jordan, more Jordy. My hero LeVar, sultan of stories, curator of knowledge, a black icon, representation I could rely on. I was so proud that I was Kunta's kin. Star Trek trekking Griot, I shared roots with him. Theme song, butterfly in the sky, so fly. Read on. No wonder why I would go try exploring worlds. I could go anywhere. Scour bookshelves. There were so many there. Now I have a daughter and my students. I seek to be a role model to them. If I could be a fraction like LeVar, they will fly twice as high and twice as far. So I, I'm also a, a big, passionate fan of, uh, of comic books, and I have a lot of comic heroes. I bring those into the classroom, too, but I always make sure that it is essential that it is happening, that I, I bring my living and uh, real heroes into the classroom as well. This is called The Reason Black Boys Need Books. Because books enchanted may be hidden from you while dirty looks, disdain, pity, or bullets may be given to you with careless abandon. And you will only be able to give some of them back. Because where else are you going to learn about 
Black superheroes from John Johnson to John Stewart, from CK to Storm, from Sojourner to Storm, from Du Bois to Darwin, from the Black Panthers to the Black Panther, because your next book could be a textbook that says nothing about you, that denies your inheritance to the mixing pot of gold forged by bronze hands, and you may never know why you may never know who you truly are. Imagine being made to believe you never counted simply by not being counted because you never did the math. So you can never understand why you live life in pieces instead of peace because fractions confuse you. Because if anyone has ever needed a secret identity, the ability to be both seen and unseen at the same time, it is you. <laughs> You who could never disappear behind glasses, who could never appear to be classless, who could never disappear in classes because your origin story cannot be covered up. They will always know where you came from, from where you were taken, and that they have a better chance of returning a half-eaten steak to the kitchen than returning you to the place from which you were taken. So rather than trying to push you out, many will be content with pushing you down so deep that you come face to face with the fossils of your forgotten family. Because at some point, everyone needs a home away from home, even when they have nowhere to go but home, because you will be dealt dying tribes like spades, and you will swallow them like false bravado men so often hollow tip that heads resound with struck like bells or bottles, warriors named and feared before found and spoken to. because you so seldom see yourself reflected in a positive light, as if all of your mirrors are dust covered, cracked or tucked away in dark corners, which is not so. You are etched so deeply in the pages of history that its spine would collapse without you, because you need to see that you are not defined by or confined to the images of you that you see so far. You need to be readers. You need these portals to posterity. You need books, and we need to write them. I had fun with this one. This one I wrote for my students uh, for Dr. King Day. And I, I blended some of my passions together again. This is called WWE. <laughs> I had a dream. I was in a three-man tag match. It was me, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and John Cena. Versus <laughs> age, anger, and racism who looked meaner than I'd ever seen him. And I said, Dr. King, I wouldn't have expected to see you in a wrestling match. And he said, well, you must know that fighting is not part of the plan. We're going to defeat these three across the ring without ever laying a hand and with a bell sounding. We knew that they were up to no good, flying off of the top ropes and raiding down on my neighborhood, starting fights between friends, denying rights, and hitting below the belt. So I started running after them because I couldn't control myself. And then all of a sudden, I felt a hand touch my arm. Be calm, said a voice. Fighting hatred with hate will do nothing but harm, Dr. King told me. He said, hate would win if I let it control me. So I stopped, relaxed trying to think of a way to do the right thing. When John Cena drew back his arm and was ready to swing at racism, hate didn't jump in and try to save him in anger, seeing that it was in danger, got so upset. It threw a temper tantrum and knocked out the raffle. Still didn't get up yet. Dr. <laughs> jumped in front of John Cena's fist and said, son, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> and John Cena's fist stopped mid-swing and it turned around back down to his sides. The three of us looked at each other and welled up with pride. Hate acted scared and said, I give up. Funny line, and tried to turn us against each other, but we refused. We knew this was a match that was too important to lose. Dr. King said, we must have WWE. <laughs> and then I realized what he meant was worldwide equality. So we said, no, we won't fight back. We'll show love instead and treat them like we want to be treated, killing them with kindness until they retreated. Believe me, I'm waving a hand to shake in front of their face, but they can't see me. All they see is hate, anger, and racism still chasing to kill any hope for peace. So I thought instead of a chokehold, I'd go hold hands with hate. 
and then not release the grip until he ceased to exist and then people would seem to shift toward each other with hands outstretched to come together. And then all of a sudden I was so filled up with love that I reached out to hug him and poof, he was gone. Cena was like, that's what's up, son. I was like, it was nothing. <laughs> and he was so mad that he screamed and then dropped kicked Cena as hard as he could, but he got up, brushed his shoulders off and was like, it's all good. <laughs> and when anger was met with understanding instead of planning to get even, it was how like third grade crushes and now it gets crushed when we see him. Then Dr. King stood mid-ring. Racism stood face to face with him and then Dr. King took out a pen started writing his I have a dream speech and with every word written began erasing him until only the memory of the word was left in place of him. Me and Cena thanked and then flanked Dr. King and began embracing him. Cena was like, yo, we wasted him. <laughs> and then just as I started realizing Dr. King was so tough, I heard a commotion outside of my window, woke up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I have one more poem to share with you. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share. I deeply appreciate it. Uh, this is called Before I Leave My Daughter With You. I wrote this before I had my first daughter. Some of the conversations that we had within the family um, and with family friends made me realize that there were things that I had to make sure I didn't let go unchallenged. I didn't let go unsaid. And so um, this was that. Before I leave my daughter with you, tell me this. When they call her hair wild, like her people, how will you defend her roots? When they reach to touch the crown of clouds condensed atop her head, how quickly will you snatch their wrists and teach her their folly and teach her to do the same when her afro gloriously tossed and sculpted by her pillow is met with wide eyes and laughter. How will you hush them and simultaneously bolster her confidence? How will you ensure that she perceives every Angela Davis to Amara La Negra compliment, comparison as a compliment? How many times will you allow others to other her and still trust them when they say they didn't mean any harm? When she is othered in white spaces, how will you ground her so deeply in herself that her ancestors speak through the soles of her feet and she sings their strength? How will you teach her not to be othered in black spaces? How much of the media in your home will be covered with black faces? And how soon will you commit to resisting complacency in the face of racism? And how long will it take you to find a comment before you discover that that's racist? How diverse will the guest list be for her parties and how black will you make the playlist? When they challenge her claim that Shuri is the greatest Disney princess of all time, what evidence will you support her claim with? And when she cries for the plight of her kinfolk, will you try to console or control her emotions? When they ask how black she is, do not show them bar graphs and pie charts. There is no chromosomal measurement needed to explain her pigment. There is no percentage of whiteness needed to placate her peers or their fears. Let them be afraid of you. When they ask, what is she? Do not hesitate for a second before shooting a glance through them that answers their intention. Do not pause or swallow the words that must be given right back. You tell them that what she is is so great and godly that that question is an insult. You tell them who she is that she is proud of who she is, maybe even a little as proud as you are. And when you say it, you best be as convinced as they are. When she asks you why you speak like this so often, tell her the truth, that there are people who want to erase the kink from her hair and cover her body with it, that the world may try to avert their eyes at the appearance of her magic, but her sorcery is to be celebrated, that the power of her potential is enough to make them all disappear. Thank you. <laughs> I want to be able to re you know revisit. Absolutely. It's wonderful, Lamar. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> 
Saigi left. He is such a fan from. Oh my! Oh my goodness! We can see continues to to continues to hold that bag. Yes. Every oh my yes. Get ready to start our last panel. Um, if maybe Tori, no, I think Rita's coming. Okay, we're getting ready to start our next panel. Is she already molding? Another one. Oh, we're waiting. Let's give another round of applause. Tony Jack. Right. So the next presentation is The Power of the Pen. Award-winning author, Corey Maldonado, the Ben Kipanger-Kepovich, and Peter The Power of Children Literature to Inspire Change. Moderated by none other than Wade Hudson. Please join me in welcoming our family. This is the uh, last panel of the afternoon, and uh, I'm just so happy because not only are these three people claim authors, they are great friends, and we've known each other for years, and really more like, like family. And uh, so I'm honored to be here to chat with them this afternoon. Um, make sure you read their bios. Uh, we passed out those to you earlier. And also go to visit their, their website so you can see what they're doing and other books they have coming out. The first book that really resonated with me was Black Boy by Richard Wright. That book was written in the 1930s, and he writes about what it was like for him growing up in Mississippi. Although I grew up decades later, I identified with the story. I identified with the experiences. So the first book to really have an impact on me, although I, I was a reader before then, and I would read many, many other books before then, but that book had an enormous impact on me. What was the first book of the first writer that have an impact on you, Rita? Um, well, uh, I read early and I read often. I was always in the library uh, checking out a book and rechecking out books. Um, but um, even though I I had a lot. I had access to a lot of those little autobiographies uh, that they wrote about Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman and um, Booker T. Washington. I, I I read all those books. There was something missing, um, and so the librarian saw me checking out this one book all the time. It was uh, called Mary Ellis Student Nurse, and she thought, "Oh, I must love that book." Um, Actually, I did not love that book. I hated that book. <laughs> it was uh, it was a story about a girl, um, a young a young lady. She was uh, she was a student nurse um, in the segregated South, and it was the only book 
with only book of fiction with a black female on it. And so even though I hated that book, I felt I had to keep checking it out because they needed to know that that book was needed or something like it was needed. I got the attention of the young librarian um, um, and she she was back in the back in the days uh, you did like your Peace Corps uh, volunteering and she went to Africa as a, a Peace Corps a volunteer. She came back and she was full of African little white girl. She was uh, full of like African dance and Afri African uh, song and culture for us and uh, which just kind of but she might, you know, just interesting to me. So anyway, um, so she got me this book called 31 Brothers and Sisters. And it was written by a white woman in the 1950s, Reba Pate Mursky. But it was about a girl who was, uh, she was the daughter of the Zulu chief. And she wanted to go on a hunt with her father, which was forbidden. Um, in the meanwhile, it was um, her brother who was supposed to go on this hunt. And, um, but uh, he would much rather write poetry. Well, hey, this is me and Russell. Um, I wanted to line up as a running back on my father's Pop Warner team. Uh, and not, uh, let me do that. Um, um, and, and I had always had my boxing gloves and I was very serious about it uh, back then, but he was like, that, that girl needs some ballet. Um, <laughs> but my, my brother was into his uh, space missions and all of that. So, um, so to see this girl with this with dark skin and very short hair, you know, um, um, who was allowed to go with her father on the hunt, and she and she took um, she managed um, she, yes she managed to, to kill um, um, I think it was leopard at the time you know that was like that was all that I needed to know is that yes one day I'm going to get, I'm going to line up you know on the fifty yard line and, you know take that snap you know um, it it was just very affirming to see. Not um, not a Procter and Gamble looking, very fair skinned girl with long hair, and this is your black girl that to emulate and wish you were her, but a little a black girl with dark skin and very short hair, and to me that just to see that, just to see her, I mean I always had um, I always had a love of books. I, always been writing since I was very little um but that just to see that she that she was there that someone um that someone said this is what a little black girl looks like um they might not have meant it to be complimentary it didn't matter because I took I saw the good in her because I saw the good in me and and so what, whatever the evil plot was, <laughs> I thwarted it because uh, you know. <laughs> she became evil. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, oh, first, I just want to say thank you for including me here, for having us all here, for bringing us together, for just a <laughs> I can't tell you how much I appreciate what you and Cheryl have done and continue to do and how much it's impacted my life, my, my child's life and the children that I've worked with and taught. And it's just really special to be here. Um, I think, I grew up in a family of storytellers. Uh, my parents were both immigrants. Uh, my mom was from Jamaica, my dad is from Nigeria. And so I grew up, always asking them to tell us stories, uh, tell us stories about back home, tell us stories about coming to the United States. Uh, we lived with my mother's parents for a while and they, for a long time, didn't have much formal education, though they later on went back to school, but they always had books and magazines and stories were just a big part of our lives. And so um, my mom especially would read to me and I would memorize um, the books that she read and then I would pretend so I would have the books like about three 
and I would hold it open and read and I knew the page turns and everything. So they thought, probably before I could really read, they thought that I could read. <laughs> and so I would get a lot of praise and I you know, feel really good about like, yeah, I can read, I can read. So, and we had just reading material all over the house. So I read a lot of books. When I think about the first book, it was like a little group at the same time um, and books that were way beyond really my understanding, but they had an impact on me. So there was this period around third grade where I read over and over a few books, Honey, I Love by Eloise Greenfield. Yes. I just would read it over and over and just look at the pictures and just, I, I loved it. Um, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings by Maya Angelou. And so that one also, because it started when she was very young, I felt like it was a book, a kid's book. <laughs> and then it just kept going. And there was a, there was a lot in her life and in that story, but she was, to me, what later on when I read Jane Austen, and it, those folks would talk about accomplished women, and I would, I would be like, like Maya Angelou, like Maya Angelou is an accomplished woman, like, like that kind of thinking. And then the autobiography of Malcolm X, I read that around that same time too. And again, there were things in the book that I didn't fully understand <laughs> at, in the third grade, but I, it was just powerful. And it was just powerful reading these books about Black people, showing Black people living these full and rich lives and doing so many different things. And then also having that with my family stories and understanding that like all parts of our lives are worthy of story and worthy of being documented and being shared and told. So when we met, Cheryl and I met you in, I think it was Albany. Yeah. Um, and you were talking about mm -hmm. your sister and yeah. how important, and your sister's actually here. Yeah, she is. Yeah. Yeah. Give a shout out to my family that's here. My sister, Cheryl, <laughs> and you know, DJ Harriet. <laughs> So what was the first book on the first author that really had an impact? Yeah, I'm, first I'm gonna sound like an echo, right? Or like a stutter, because I wanna um, echo what Bemi just said about you and about Cheryl. Um, I feel like even though I'm four books published, three more books on the way, and you know, you said read my bio, and I look at the bio, I feel as though the real timeline or the trajectory of, of my publishing career is right here on this panel. And the reason is because my very first book, Secret Saturdays, came out, and right on the cover, I couldn't believe the name Rita Williams Garcia. <laughs> what, I said, <laughs> yeah, Rita Williams Garcia, the blur of my book. <laughs> they sent me the book, it was good. Oh, man. <laughs> And then my very first reading um, in a bookstore was in Barnes & Noble on 7th Avenue and Park Slope, standing room only. And I don't think they were there to see me. I think they were there to see Ben. <laughs> my very first reading. And then um, just to circle back, the, my very first book fair that I ever was at, where two people came up to me and said, um, you got a minute? I said, for you, I got, I got a day, I got a week, I got a month or a year. He said, um, well, we got to get on the microphone and the tent and speak. And that that's right. That's right. was Wade Hudson. Yeah, and that was Cheryl Hudson yeah. at the Harlem Book Fair. That's right. So I feel as though, you know, and there's a lot of people in here I have shout outs to, but I got to answer to your question. Okay, I answer your question. Exactly. <laughs> and then I got to right, so. Okay. <laughs> so, um, how many people? No, well, I, I, not a lot of people know who this person is. He's not so well known. Malcolm X. <laughs> well, how many people know the iconic speech that he gives? But he says, "Who taught you to hate yourself? Yeah. Who taught you to hate your nose, the color of your skin?" Raise your hand if that resonates with you, right? Well, I'd like to flip it because um, it's connected to the book um, that ignited or ignites me to write. Um, who taught me first to love words? Which book first taught me to love myself and to love our people? And I would have to say 
That was my mother. My mother, we grew up in Red Hook Projects. Does anybody know Red Hook Projects? Right? Red Hook Projects called uh, the crack capital of the United States of America and one of the 10 worst neighborhoods in the country by Life Magazine. And I will never forget my mom would call me over in the apartment. And she'd say, to me for a second. And I would come over. And my family could attest to this, that this is true. She would open up a spiral notebook with her handwriting in it. And she would read to me. And her words were the first words that made me feel self-love. They were the first words that made me see that there was a magic in my apartment. There was a magic in me. There was a magic in our community that others weren't seeing. And my mom is a trip because my mom, she would tell me to remember quotes, right? It is, she would say, repeat after me, good, better, best. Never let it rest until your good gets better and your better gets best, right? <laughs> but she would also tell me other quotes and I would run to school and she never cited her sources. <laughs> <laughs> so there was this one teacher who was real awesome and she would do this thing where she said, okay, time for us to find out what we're learning outside of the building. So she did the go around and say, teach us something that someone taught you that we should know about. So I raised my hand and the old, you know, the old school welcome back Potter. <laughs> I raised my hand and say, my mom came up with this quote. <laughs> Ready? You rainbow in somebody else's cloud. Oh. And the teacher looked at me. <laughs> And she didn't out me in front of everybody, but she at the end of the class, she said, Man, why did come up with that? <laughs> that was Maya Angelo, right? <laughs> and then um, she told me another quote, too. She said, uh, People will forget, and it's the next of books. Mm -hmm. People will forget yep. what you say. Yep. They will forget the words, but they will never forget how you made them feel. Yeah. And my mom always wrote in a way that made me feel. And she inspired me to write in a way where young people come up to me and go, yo, bro, how do you, how do you know about my life? <laughs> and I'm like, I don't. You're from St. Louis. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. But and I've had young people come up to me and have whole, they hate books. One guy in St. Louis told me he's allergic to books. But he read my whole book in one day. Mm. And he had recited parts. And I thought he was punking me. He was like, you wrote the raps in your first book? And I was like, oh. Um, yeah, why? Wow. And he's like, you remember them? I was like, no. He's like, I do. <laughs> he started reciting them. <laughs> and when he started reciting them, I was looking around over my shoulder like, it's not moving up a chart. <laughs> so I just have to say that I have to give props to my mom. And one of the reasons why is you and Cheryl Q did to this. We were in Albany and we were singing a song. At the table, we just broke into a song, something inside so strong. Yeah, yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. And, I, and then y'all saw me speak. And then you both came up to me and said, you have, You're you going to write a story. It's going to be in the anthology of the talk. And it's going to be about your mother. And it's going to be about your sister. And I wrote that. So I have to just give props to my mom, especially because my mom, within two years, you know, <laughs> she passed on and is now with the ancestors. So I have to share another quote that's just hers. Y'all ready for this? I never heard it before. <laughs> she told me, Tori, you have little with great power. <laughs> it's great responsibility. And I, I was like, mm, that's really good. Did she? I didn't question her. I should have questioned her. <laughs> but anyway, um, she passed away on National Spider-Man Day. And that book comes from Ben Parker and Spider-Man. So I feel as though, uh, you know, her book, also, her book and her writing also inspired me because she told me that we have a responsibility with the pen, and we have a responsibility with the word. So, Tony Barnum said, writing for me. Tony Barnum said, writing for me is thinking, and it's also a way to position myself in the world, particularly when I don't like what's going on. I knew I always was compelled to do it, but I didn't know how essential it was for me. I wrote the first book because I wanted to read it. I thought that kind of book with that subject, those most vulnerable, most undescribed, 
not taken seriously, little black girls had never existed seriously in literature. No one has ever written about them except as props. Since I couldn't find a book that did that, I thought, well, I'll write it and then I'll read it. It was really the reading impulse that got me into the writing thing. What got you into the writing thing? Okay. <laughs> um, you know, I I, I want to say that it's something very profound, um, but it, um, in actuality, it is not. Well, maybe it is. Um, I I also grew up in the projects. I was in Far Rockaway projects, uh, and uh, my my father was always away. He was in the army, so he was always overseas somewhere while my mother was holding it down. Um, my mother would go to work and leave my sister in charge. Um, I would be in the playpen and she and Russell would be on the outside. And uh, Rosalind, I was one, Russell was two, Rosalind was three. Uh, and we would call her teacher. And um, uh, and so when Sherry Lewis would come on TV, Sherry Lewis and Lamb Chops, you don't have to Google that if you don't know, um, that was the time that she was to give us our sandwiches and give the baby some milk, okay? I uh, give her her motto. Um, so after that, um, uh, give the baby her book. And so my uh, my sister would slide a, uh, a different picture book in between the slats of, of, of my playpen. She didn't read it to me or anything. She would just give me the book and I would turn the pages and tell myself the story. Um, and so, um, so, okay, there, you're going to feel a pattern. There's something about this book I didn't like. Okay. <laughs> um, it was a story about a, a, a it was called the lonely girl or the lonely doll. Anyway, um, the little girl is um, she has these two, uh, she has these friends frenemies um, the bears uh, uh, father bear and and the baby bear and uh, and so it would be about their adventures and at one point. The, the father bear spanks the little girl. Notice, I so this is, uh, I, I just, I did not like that. Anyway, um, so I had it from the beginning, I can do this better. I would, you know, I would think about how I would do that, how I would um, have them all playing together or whatever it was. And so I always entertain myself by telling myself stories. Um, um, and, and so by the time I was outside of the pen, I was writing stories. I could read a little bit um, and I had the most creative spelling you ever wanted to see. <laughs> um, but this is like, so, so this is where I, always, I never thought, oh, I'm going to be a writer when I grow up. Well, I already wrote better than the person that did the three bear the bear story, you know. So, uh, so it just did not occur to me that one day I would be. So, I wrote the um. Uh, so I went to kindergarten, and um, and, and so the big thing was doing the finger painting and and the coloring and all of that. And so when it was time for that, I would always say. And I have paper and a pencil instead. I want to write a story. And so I didn't just write a story. I had to have like a cover and then I had a copyright page. <laughs> and my publisher was GI government issue. Because <laughs> my father was in the army and then I'd always put the gear, you know, and, and, and then um, a, a big C next to my name. I knew that, you know, that meant nobody would steal your stories. <laughs> Was on to that teacher, you know. So I, you know, so in my head, it, it it just didn't like the when am I when is that going to happen? But it wasn't until I was um tw uh, about uh, twelve and uh, my family had moved around a lot, being in the army, and now we were 
back in uh, uh, New York, which is where um, I, I was born. And um, and so I thought, oh, okay, so my father didn't come out of Vietnam 100%, as many of our family members, you know, um, a, a experience. And so he could not hold, really hold on to a job and, um, and money was not forthcoming and we had to live with my grandmother. And so I just remembered, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a writer. Um, let me figure out how to get paid. You know, let's just, you know, let's get this going. Um, cause at that point, my mother, my mother was going to Salvation Armies and to funerals uh, to see what the people had. So um, so uh, for clothing for my sister and brother and I, and I did not want to go to school in like a 90 year old lady's you know, like clothing. So um, I started, so I uh, go to the library, check out the writer's handbook, the writer's market, um, and then the literary marketplace, which was a reference book that they didn't allow me to check out, but um, but they let me peruse it anyway, because what am I going to do with it? Anyway, um, I learned how to, uh, I learned how to create a, a manuscript and how to write a query letter and to have SACE, uh, so address the envelope. So that's where my money went to, you know, with my um, investing in my writing career. And I, uh, my sister got the typewriter there's such injustice in the world, um, and uh, that that I wanted, and I would have to rent the typewriter from her. But I knew that this was a tax deduction, so oh I kept the record. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, so I started typing my stories and sending them out to McCall's magazine um, and like a Ladies Home Journal, um, Esquire. Um, Argosy, like all the men's magazines um, as well. Um, I had a story about a Vietnam, um, a Vietnam veteran, veteran that I sent to like Argosy magazine and got the rejection letter back very quickly. Um, but you know, but but this is this is where it didn't come from someone; it came from me, and it was up to me to um, to like to chase it down, to find out the information. And I think that's one of the best things I did for myself back then um, was go to the library and find out, what do I do next? How do I do this? How do I get in touch with publishers? And um, um, how do I get my story accepted? All of those things I learned how to prepare a manuscript uh, because I did not want them to know I was like 12 years old. Somehow they knew. Uh, <laughs> and, and it's one of the things that um, that I that I admire young people today is that they are from the Google generation. You know, they're from the information is out there. All I have to do is reach out and grab it. And so, um, you know, so it was it was that and writing five hundred words every night. I had a I had a um, we spoke about a writer's journal. I had a writer's journal. I had an idea book uh, with all my with um, uh, dialogue and, and and scenes in it. I had a uh, a business book that told me like with like uh, where to send things and how to talk to editors. Um, and I had a diary, um, which is really more like a TV uh, TV guide when I go back and look at it now. But I had a diary. I did all of that, did my homework, got all of that stuff out of the way so I could write my novel, which was 500 words every night. And then I got to 1,000 words. And then I was getting to a point where I had to write a, put a stop sign in the corner to make myself stop. Um, but I think that there's so many, I think we're all self-motivated out there. Yeah. And I'm going to ask you that where you get the motivation and- Poverty. And, and, and also <laughs> the, the, the courage to just step out there. Well, when a lot of people, you know, they stop themselves. Um, I, um, it, it just didn't occur to me. Um, I, I didn't care. I think I think it's because being the baby, uh, my sister and brother made fun of me. You know, I, I was just odd. I was weird. Um, 
people made fun of me for different reasons and whatever they were, I just didn't care because I, I knew what I wanted to do. And I always had in the back of my head, one of these days they'll see when I'm up there getting my Pulitzer Nobel Prize, you know. Um, I, I always had these little narratives going on in my head. That's all right. I'm going to fight Muhammad Ali one of these days and show him. Like, I always had, like, a scenario running. So it, it was just peculiar to me. I was just, like, um, it, it didn't matter what you threw at me. Somehow, somewhere. That's who you are. Yeah. That's who you are. I guess. Yeah. What about you? Um, I think it started really young for me. I started from my love of books. Um, I was I was allowed to read anything and read widely. And I was fortunate in that we had a lot of books that also, in addition to books that were from the US, we had books from the West African tradition, the Caribbean tradition. So then when I would read a lot of racist books as a kid and I would, be able to kind of just start substituting and putting in my own version of things like, oh, and I would reread a lot. So I'd be like, okay, I would read a lot of Agatha Christie, for instance. And I'd be like, okay, there's like, I love these books. There's racist parts coming up. So what am I gonna put in instead to just keep reading? So I would like insert my own bits of the story um, from a very early age. Then also I came from what my friend considered was a rather strict household. And my sister and I were not allowed to watch much TV at all. We could watch one hour a week, and it was only like PBS. <laughs> so um, I would go to school, and we moved around the world a lot. So we, I was in a different school every grade. So everywhere I went, everybody could watch more TV than me. Um, so I would go to school and everyone would be talking about the shows that they watched and I would just keep quiet and just nod and pretend like I knew what they were talking about. And then I would go home and I would make little books and write and illustrate stories for my little sister. Um, because in addition to having access to books, we always had access to notebooks and markers. I had like those big sets of markers. And so I would write stories for my little sister. I was the oldest. So I would write stories for her if she did what I said. And <laughs> I would tell her stories based on sort of what shows my friends were talking about. And also because I was very, very shy, I would just listen a lot. So like in the different schools and the different school cultures I was in, I would just sort of sit back and listen and sort of take in all the stories that were happening. And when I got to around 11, 12, my parents were like, you're just too shy. Like, we have to do something about it. So they made me do drama. And so I started reading plays at that point. And at first I hated actually performing, but then I really got to love it. And I started negotiating with teachers. So we would get assignments and I would say, how about instead of me doing the assignment, I write a play about the topic or I write a story about the topic and I would just start and it would work. Like they would be like, if it's good, okay. So, so that would work. So I started doing that. And then I wrote a play for like the NAACP AXO competition. Wow. And I got to take a trip and like win stuff. And so then I was like, oh, this writing thing. Like <laughs> not only is it helping me with assignments, not only is it just like, what I can do, but, so I thought I was gonna be a playwright um, at first in middle school. And then I thought magazine editing mm -hmm. seemed really glamorous. <laughs> and so my, toward the end of high school, I just wrote to like Word Up Magazine and Write On Magazine, just like, hey, can I write for you for free? And at that time, it was pretty easy to do that. So they were like, yeah, kid, sure. <laughs> you don't want to get paid, sure. And the editors of those magazines let me write pretty much anything. And I would interview artists and I would sort of start inserting fiction into the, into the interview. <laughs> and sometimes the artists would come back and be like, I really like how you made me say, oh, I see. or I really like how you made me sound. Um, so I really was just, 
I loved it. And I think I knew that I wanted to write for kids because books have been so important to me for through that childhood period as a shy kid, as a kid who moved around. And like my books were really like my friends. They helped me work out how to be. They helped me think about my life. Think about the questions that I had. Think about things that I couldn't, I was too shy to say. They helped me kind of work out. So I knew that like I wanted to do that for, for kids as well. What about you, Tori? Yeah. Um, yeah, we you started talking about family. I got a little family here. I we talk about my family over there. I also want to give a shout out to my Vassar family. I have Vassar's in the house. What's up? If you're in the house, you're in the house. What's up, Vassar? Um, as soon as I walked in the door, oh, what way did I say? He was like, yeah, and, yeah, and, and Couture was like, you got Vassar people in here. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you, Vassar, for showing up too. Um, I've been teaching for close to 30 years. And this is what you say, you know, you don't teach people those kind of the lotion, right? The lotion. <laughs> Black don't rap. And so <laughs> what happened is I remember there was uh, one year where I was dreading going back to school after the summer break. And it was that at that time where all the teachers have to go back and set up their classrooms. And my mom told me something that has really been a message that has dotted throughout my life. That you better get up in there. You better get your spot. Because if any of you have, have experience with education, especially in public schools, you know that if you show up a day too late, another teacher stole your desk, right? <laughs> but you might be teaching with, instead of having 24 uh, chairs, you might be <laughs> teaching 24 kids with two chairs, right? It's like a musical chair situation. And so um, I hear that you better make sure you're up in the spot when you talk about Toni Morrison and writing for positionality, making sure that black voices are centered, that we're up in, we're up in the spot. Um, that connects to my upbringing. I, I'm gonna share this, and I know you, when we go out for lunch or whatever, my sister's gonna be like, why'd you share that? <laughs> you know, mommy didn't like you saying that. Um, in the third grade, I got left back. My mother hates that because I, who here has a parent or a guardian who they were your biggest fan? You do a little thing and they exaggerate it, right? Like your, your first step, they went around and said, oh, she ran across the room, right? Or you had a little, you drew, drew a little thing and oh, it's a masterpiece, right? My mom was the queen of exaggeration. And um, I'll never forget that help because when I was in the, uh, my, well, she should exaggerate how I was born writing, which isn't true, right? I didn't come out with a wound writing, but it mean, helped me because I'll never forget, it was around the third grade that I realized something. I realized that if books don't love kids, kids won't love books. Mm -hmm. oh. And I don't know if it was intentional from the 1930s to when I was around as a third grader, but it was definitely structural that all of the classroom literature and all of the literature in the libraries centered white, whiteness. They were all white. How many of you grew up in a, in a neighborhood where it was just the, the schools only centered white people, right? And if there were black people in it uh, or brown people in it, we were a side character or we were stereotyped. And so it was in the third grade that I decided school doesn't love me, so I'm not gonna love school. So I figured out how to cut. And I thought, I'm, you know, kids think they're so much fun than the adults, right? I thought I was cutting and my mom wouldn't find out until back in the day when they did the truancy letters. And she showed me the stack of letters and she's like, this is how many times you've been absent from school. And I was like, how, how, what, what type of magic trick are you playing? How did you, this is not true. Anyway, so it left me back in the third grade. And, um, I disconnected from school, but I didn't disconnect from the power of story because every day I drew, I drew superheroes. I always drew superheroes. And we had an Uncle Ronnie, right? And Uncle Ronnie, I'll never forget, it was in about the fourth grade that I showed him some of my drawings. He was like, oh wow, Superman. Oh yeah, listen, listen to this theme and tell me, what do all of these characters have in common? He says, oh, wow, Superman. Oh, yeah, Batman. 
Wolverine, Spider Man. If you take all their masks off, what race are they? Tells me, he goes, Why are you going to draw a superhero that looks like you? And it was that moment that he had planted a seed that it didn't, it, it didn't blossom until much later, but I started to think, yeah, why don't I just make that little shift and draw a superhero that looked like us, right? And so I started to do that. And I'll never um, forget, it wasn't until the seventh grade where I began to realize maybe I could be a writer. My mom was saying it since I was little, right? Since I was in the third grade, fourth grade, she would go around the neighborhood and say, Tori's going to be writing books someday. <laughs> so we talking about having narratives in your head. Yeah. I had the narrative in my head that if bagging, bagging on bags in the supermarket wouldn't work out for me, I'm always going to be a writer anyway, <laughs> right? So even in the darkest times when we were broke, broke, I still was like, oh, I'm going to be a writer someday. It don't matter. This doesn't matter, right? And um, I'll never forget it was in the seventh grade, I wrote this story. And listen to this. It was called The Penny and the Dime. And it was about race. And it was questioning why is a black life worth this much? When the penny, when the dime, if you look at the dime, the dime is actually smaller than the penny. Yes, it is. But it has 10 times more value. And I wrote this. And I'll never forget her name. Should I say her name? Should I out the teacher? Look at the bastard in the house. Yeah, hell yeah, say it. Say it. Say it. No, I'm not saying it. I'm not gonna do it dirty like she did me dirty. But I'll never forget <laughs> this. Uh, don't forget this. How many of you have ever been told this? If someone hits you, you better hit back. And my family was the first to raise their hand over there. They were like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I remember the images that would come back to me about my neighborhood through media. And it almost felt like a punch in the face or a punch in the gut. And then when Life Magazine came out with the article with a nine page photo spread about our neighborhood, you remember it, right? She still has the book. I, I felt like they picked me up and body slammed. Mm -hmm. But I always had that message from my mother. If they hit you, you better hit back. Mm -hmm. And this seventh grade teacher really hit me hard because she handed back all the papers, but my paper was ungraded. And then she said, can I speak to you after class? So I walked to her. And it was in the same building that I teach in. Mm. Well, she comes, she comes up to me and she says, um, I have reason to believe that you did not write this story. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel it now, like I'm being hit again. So I went home. And any of you had, or, or had a guardian who could tell how you felt, just by looking at your face, mm -hmm. right? That's why Spider-Man, the our Spider-Man, Miles Morales, and the black Puerto Rican Spider-Man, if I get superhero, we all have ESP, right? And then those, it's my, my two nieces and little nieces, and I'm not gonna say the word, but it's a BS detector, but you can tell, right? So my mom sees my face and says, what's wrong with you? And my mom told me, she's like, um, what do you don't like what people are saying about you? and tell the truth. So this is what happened. I go back home, my mom sees my face, it's like, what's wrong with you? And I say, my um, teacher, Miss, you want me to say the name? Yeah. No, I'm going to say that. <laughs> said, Miss so-and-so said that she wants to use under school because she thinks that I don't plagiarize the story. My mother, in this book, I call her Yoda. Because you know, Yoda is small, but full of the force and very strong. My mom is my Yoda. She came to school like battle warrior. She came to the teacher. The teacher was like three feet taller than her. It looked like my mom towered over her. And my mom said, don't you dare say that my son copied anybody whose words because I saw him write every period, every comma, every, everything in that story. And this is when the teacher, you ever had somebody flip from, right? From being your hater to being your celebrator? And this is when the person goes, I'll say the name, but it is Miss. No, I'm not going to do it. Look, <laughs> she goes, she goes, she goes, well, if you write like this, you really have a writing potential. Mm. And I think that you could, you could be a writer someday. And it was in that moment that I started that seed that my Uncle Ronnie planted. Why don't you 
draw superheroes that like us, I started to think, well, why don't I start to write more stories like this about us? Mm -hmm. And so that story, the, the Penny and the Dime, I rewrote that story as an adult, and Oprah Winfrey painted it as one of her favorite books mm -hmm. to teach young people about race, about true friendship and allyship. And I don't have the book right now, um, my niece told me, can my niece hold up the book real quick? Yeah, you hold that book up? Right there, that's the book, it's called What Lane? So, I mean, you know, if you get hit, find your weapon and hit back, right? And listen to the narratives in your head, you know? I want to take you a question. In, in, uh, question period. in, in um, Notes of a Native Son, uh, James Baldwin wrote this. One writes out of one thing only, one's own experiences. Everything depends on how relentlessly one forces from this experience the last drop, sweet or bitter, it can possibly give. This is the only real concern of the artist, to recreate out of the disorder of life, order, which is art. Now, each of you deal with difficult themes uh, in your books. Um, so how do you decide what you want to write about and how much does your life experience uh, play a role in, in what you write? Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, start this off because um, I, didn't re I didn't realize that I wrote about difficult things. I just thought I wrote truthful things. Um, I always thought about um, a child's life and that it's not the simple um, story with the happy ending that a lot of children and a lot of young people live in maybe constant doubt or anxiety or in, a, um, in an unnurturing situation. So I always try to remember that um, and to respect the fact that a child's life is not always easy. Um, that said, um, I wrote a book in the early 2000s no laughter here about um, about two girls, two best friends, uh, one um, one African American and one African. And um, the African American girl see, notices that after her friend has come home, um, has come back from being in Africa for the summer, uh, Nigeria um, for the summer, that she's different. And so now we, um, uh, I introduce the topic of female genital mutilation to young readers, okay? Yes, a very difficult topic. And um, I actually, I didn't ask, I, I, I hear what most people do is they propose, uh, they propose a subject, a book to an editor. I did not do that. I told her what I would be writing. Um, and and um, and there was just no negotiating it. I it didn't occur to me that they would say, "Oh well, you know, we met, you know." I just said, "This is what I'm writing," um, and um, it helped me to just say, "This happens to two million girls every year. This happens." This is a child's reality. It might not be happening here in the United States, as far as we know, um, but this is real for uh, for um, for so many young girls, and um, it is part of culture, and so that influences how they feel about it. So I have to respect that that it's not that I can't approach it from my very American point of view that I have to be respectful in a certain way. Um, but then I always said to myself, this is about girls. This is about friendship. This is about trust. And I know people have a hard time, um, especially in this country, um, talking about 
uh, any kind of sexuality, a genitalia, anything, we, we all, all of a sudden, we, you know, we, we have a problem with being able to discuss it, even though our, our economy is based on exploiting um, sexuality. But when we talk about honest, um, honest um, uh, representation of the human self, you know, oh, we, well, we have a problem, that's too real, we can't talk about that. We're gonna talk about it. And so um, for me, I just said, okay, you have all this research, you have all of these social political ideas of your own in your head. You've been to these seminars, you've read all of these books, you've, entered, uh, you've um, uh, heard from a lot of these grown women. Now, filter it through the voice and the experience of a child and let that guide you. Um, and so that, that is the, it's the approach that I take toward when I was writing about um, um, three little girls being introduced into the world of, of the, uh, the Black Panthers of the 1960s yeah. and, and anything else that I've written, I always say, okay, as much as you know about it, as much as you think about it, you know, it's not about you, you know, Filter it through the eyes and heart and soul and what's important to that child and you'll connect with the child leader. Yeah. So, so that, that, that's my little thing. That's how I yeah, mean. Yeah, yeah. I think we've they give me a, uh, with three minutes left. So I need both of you to comment on that, but quick shot. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I could just echo a lot of that. I think I I don't really choose by topic, but I'm usually thinking of characters. And it's just what I hear and what I see. And when I talk to young people, the message I always want to send is that your story is precious. Mm -hmm. Just as it is, just as you are, is your story is valuable and precious. And so our lives are so multifaceted that, and the joyful things exist with the deeply, deeply painful things and the challenging things. And it just wouldn't feel honest to write without including all of those parts of our lives and all of the things that happen to very young children all the way up throughout our lives to say that it's part of being human. It's part of the human experience. I had a writing teacher with my first book who said, um, oh, this is such a purple book. When I asked her what it meant, she was like, you take the happy parts and you color them in red and the sad parts and put them in blue and you put it together and it's purple and that's real and that's what life is. And so that's, I'm always trying to write to authenticity and to honor young people's real lives. Um, yeah, I know who Betsy Bird is, Betsy Bird, right? Betsy Bird with the um, School Library Journal and Fuse 8, she, um, she asked me for an interview for my most recent book, Hands. But I was so busy with a lot of the stuff, including with the death, I being robbed by the death of my mom, that um, I didn't give her the interview. Then all of a sudden, I'm on the internet, and there's this huge write up about me. And she was like, I'm not going to wait for the interview. I'm just going to do a review of the book. And she did a review of the book. And one of the things she said is, Tori Maldonado is a master. And I'm, I'm big enough myself right now, but I'm not really. She said, he's a master at writing. Um, everything that the thick books have, but with a thin page count. Mm. All of my books are 150 pages and under. Now you also notice that all of my books, comic books and references to superheroes go from the first page to the last page, right? And this goes back to what really you were saying about, you remember what you write for, right? Um, I write for middle school kids. And I don't know a middle school kid, except for a few who don't like roller coasters. So I try to make roller coasters. I make roller coaster narrative where young people get on it and then they are done with the book in a day or two. And then they are saying, I want to get back on that ride. So they either read my book again and a lot of young people come to me and say, I read your book four times. Mm -hmm. Or they read all my books. Or they come up to me and they say, what other people write like you? And then I say, you know, Oleg Bema? Do you know Bonasola? Do you know Maria? Do you know Wade? Do you know Eric? Do you know that goes through this, right? So the thing I want to say real quick is I say this to a lot of young people. I ask them, I say, what are you a master at? What are you a master at? Right? 
Because when that quote you, you read, it's really TLC's song, Don't Go Chasing Waterfalls, Tip to the Rivers in the, right? That's that. So I asked young people, I say, what are your last that? And they go, I don't know, I don't know. But Malcolm Gladwell says that if you spend 10,000 hours on something, you become a master at that. What have you spent 10,000 hours on? And everybody says it, on being myself. And that's one of the reasons why I encourage young people, tell, go back to your roots. Tell your story as authentically as possible. Hold no punches back. But here's the rule, and I've discovered this. And the reason why is because I don't want my family to disinvite me to the cookout, right? And say, I can't come over to Thanksgiving or Christmas. When you write, hold no punches back, but don't hurt anybody you love. Yep. And don't hurt yourself. And so, um, yeah, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, now I think a little over. So let's thank Tori for giving me the video. And I'm going to make sure that you have an opportunity to invite the books. So, any other authors and illustrators, please come up front. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, I think we are going to take a before you all leave. So, Evan, we are in your hands in terms of how you want to stage this. So it's be three to my dad's um right and yeah, my mom. So we will be in the middle. Alright, so everybody from this side kind of like turn this way so I can fit in. So turn this way. Yeah. Let me come here. Spread this out. Yeah. When it's not doing a lot of stuff. So, what's up? That's my life. And we'll be this way. So, everybody's in the last line. Good. 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 All right. And hold on. And And last one up, everybody, wave on this side. Raise your left hand this side with your right hand. Like, wave five. Here we go. And All right. We're good. Thank you, bro.